Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Shashank Maurya, uh, Ms. Archana Jatka, Dr. Jyoti Kaul. Uh, Amit, Amit, two minutes, two minutes less. Uh, uh, attendees, just five minutes, attendees will join. Okay, okay. They're joining, no? Okay. Yeah, okay. sweet. Just a small. Uh, we should uh, stick to our schedule. And we're already running behind our schedule. Uh, uh, this is to formally uh, welcome all the distinguished guests, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Shashank Maurya, Dr. Jyoti Kaul. Ms. Archana Jatka and other distinguished, uh, uh, you know, pan, uh, uh, speakers here, Honorable um, Vice Chancellor Sir Professor Rajesh Danka, uh, my co-host uh, Dr. Vyas uh, uh, MS, uh, Dean School of Biosciences, and other esteemed faculty members for, from different departments at the university. Uh, as you all know that uh, we are uh, celebrating and commemorating World Intellectual Property Day today, which is, uh, uh, you know, celebrated worldwide by the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is a, uh, which is a uh, specialized agency of the United Nations uh, with the, around 193 member states of the United Nations. The mission of uh, World Intellectual Property Organization is to lead the development of a balanced and effective international IP system that enables innovation and creativity for the benefit of all. Our, the mandate of uh, World Intellectual Property Organization's uh, governing bodies and procedures are uh, set out in the 1967 IPO Convention uh, by which the World Intellectual Property Organization was established as a specialized agency of the United Nations later on. Uh, the significance of uh, <clears throat> today's uh, day is that it uh, is organized uh, just to uh, create awareness about uh, the you know intellectual property, uh, which has now uh, become so much uh, important in our daily lives. In fact, we, you know, wherever we uh, put our eyes and ear, we will find intellectual property present in that, uh, you know, aspect. So every day of our today, every day's life is being touched by one or other aspect of intellectual property. There are many forms of intellectual property. Also, um, the you know, it is also to celebrate the interdisciplinarity. Uh, aspect of intellectual property where uh, it encompasses uh, cr across disciplines uh, and in fact uh, science and law when policy are the you know the, the prominent uh, aspects of intellectual property and therefore it is to further that cause of uh, you know emphasizing the interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity aspect of uh, intellectual property discourse. Uh, the uh, the two schools at APJ Satya University, School of Legal Studies and School of Biosciences, have put our efforts together to in 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 putting up these uh, uh, you know uh, minds, these esteemed guests uh, who will be having their dis you know technical sessions, through which I am sure uh, we will be enhancing our understanding and awareness about 
the intellectual property more uh, particularly uh, from the viewpoint of science and public policy uh, aspects of intellectual property so to begin with uh, we have amongst us uh, uh, the the uh, distinguished panelist uh, comprising of dr sachank maurya who who is who has been a former assistant director general intellectual property technology management and international relations at indian council for agricultural research uh, uh, ms archana jatka who is uh, the industry representative with us today uh, she is associate secretary general indian pharmaceutical alliance based in mumbai uh, we have dr jyoti kaul uh, uh, she is a principal scientist plant breeding uh, basically in mage genetics unit of indian council of agricultural research and we will be having the last uh, our speaker is dr santanu d vice president msn labs hyderabad uh we will be having our inaugural address uh, uh, to be delivered by our honorable vice chancellor uh, professor rajesh dhankar uh, uh, uh and, and and before that uh, if i could uh, put uh, the the conversation in context uh just before uh, five years before uh, in in may 2016 india has actually enacted its uh, national uh, national intellectual property policy and to streamline the intellectual property in 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 you know uh, in ma mainstream discourses and uh, to uh, you know how ip can be commercialized and put into entrepreneurship start up startups and uh, you, know, you know development perspective so this uh, this may 2000 in, in fact it was 12 12th of may 2016 uh, union cabinet approved national ipr policy to lay the future road map for intellectual property in india and it is said that it is one of its first of its kind policy for india covering all forms of intellectual property in a single framework this policy is a is in compliance with the world trade organizations wto's trips agreement on which uh, ms jatkar will be actually uh, focusing upon uh, especially uh, putting uh, you know ip development uh, at the trips a uh, forum uh, from you know from the viewpoint of current global pandemic which we are facing so this national ip policy is a vision document that aims to create and exploit synergies between all forms of intellectual property concerned with statutes and other agencies the ipr policy sets in place an instrumental mechanism for implementation monitoring and review of ip ip discourse in the country Uh, the policy aims to incorporate and adopt global best practices to the indian scenario and this policy is expected to weave the strengths of the government research and development organizations educational institutions corporate entities including micro small and medium enterprises msmes startups and other stakeholders in the creation of an innovation conducive environment which stimulates creativity and innovation across sectors as also facilitates a stable transparent and service oriented intellectual property rights administration in the country in fact to also uh, point out uh, this year's theme uh, of world ip day is intellectual property and small and medium enterprises taking into taking ideas to the market so in this context i would like to invite uh, uh, professor uh rajesh dankar vice chancellor apj satya university uh to deliver the inaugural address but before that i will just briefly uh, mention about uh, dr professor rajesh dankar professor dankar has held a very uh, he has very long uh, sprawling career he has held responsible administrative positions like ceo higher education apj education society new delhi he has been vice chancellor of maharshi dayanand university rohtak haryana and vice chancellor ansal university gurgaon he has also been vice chancellor mit university raipur director center for canadian studies professor in charge faculty of management studies south campus principal maharaja grisen college provost Sa saramati post graduate men's hostel south campus and chairman finance area faculty of management studies university of delhi he holds phd uh, in held in 1983 and pds 1987 in the area of finance 
Dr. Dhankar, a thought leader and institution build, builder, is the ex-dean of the prestigious Faculty of Management Studies, University of Delhi. Professor Dhankar has been visiting professor at Lakehead University, Canada, chair professor of finance at Ansel University, and is the professor emeritus School of Management Studies, APJ Sophia University. Uh, it's my proud pleasure to invite uh, Professor Dhankar for the inaugural address, please. Uh, Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yes, sir, perfectly audible. Yes. Uh, let me at the outset, uh, of course, uh, wish all the participants, delegates, this symposium a great success. But much more than that, uh, I would say that let in this challenging time, this, this COVID-19 crisis, we all remain healthy and safe and come out as a winner by fighting this menace. And I have a sense that much of this battle would be, should be fought and will be won within us internally, saying to ourselves that we will win, I'll fight it out, and I remain healthy. That motive and that objective, I think, uh, is the key uh, in this in this uh, hard times. Uh, this particular symposium uh, uh, is, is is a great uh, uh, idea, uh, particularly for the fact that uh, see what we are really saying. Uh, whatever name you call it, call it intellectual property, call it human capital, human resource, whatever term you may use. But the fact of the matter is, it is human capital. It is human resource, which is the most critical resource in the world. We may say we have a large population. Many people need to be educated, but we have to see the positive side of it. Any organization, I'm a student of management, and we say organization has five capital M's, men, money, machine, methods, and markets. If all these five M's, capital M's rather, are managed well in a very optimal fashion, that organization grows. So as true with any country as well. But among these five capital M's, men or intellectual resource is the most important and critical actually. It is in this context, to my mind, we have to really see the importance of intellectual property. How we develop it and preserve it is the, is the whole issue here. What we are talking is not just human resource, we're talking of efficient human resource, productive human resource. An efficient and productive human resource has to be developed with the right kind of knowledge and skill sets. And once you provide an individual, a citizen, the right kind of knowledge and skill sets, there is no stopping of that person. And if you do that from the grassroots level, from early on in, in school education, and right, you keep on doing right up to the master's level or research level or a PhD, whatever you call it, then I think it's a matter of time before that 
country becomes a world power because knowledge believe me this is the biggest has the biggest multiplier effect in life once you have it the it it keeps on rewarding you endlessly till your last breath therefore we literally have to think in terms of empowering our citizens with the right kind of knowledge and skill sets and make them productive and efficient there is no denying of the fact in 21st century that the country which will become the leader of the world will have the largest numbers and amount of intellectual capital and this intellectual capital is transferable look at our writers our professors scientists today they are in india tomorrow they are in united states they travel they move out and with them who's out the intellectual capital of the country we talk about competitive advantage these days in the world a nation which has the highest level and amount of competitive advantage they'll grow in industry business trade and otherwise but human resource right human kind of human resource is the best and most effective competitive advantage we would witness in the 21st century it is high time in our own country we start valuing it realizing the importance of human resource of all kinds for that matter and keep on developing it making it efficient and productive as i said the challenge is or will be rather developing it and preserving it we firstly to develop it how to develop intellectual resource you know the culture i always lay great emphasis on a culture in an organization if your organization has a right kind of culture it will grow if it doesn't have then i think it will fall on the wayside sooner or later it's a matter of time so how to develop that culture of developing the intellectual resource or property i think the most important thought here is to have free thinking open mindedness look at all the great giants scientists newton einstein i was reading about swami vivekananda he died early as we all know but he became a giant in its own lifetime but if you go go into the background of that person what it all started is what his father told him that you have to be a open 
minded person. Keep your mind open all the time. Think rationally, think critically. Don't accept anything. As people say, we tell our children, do this, do that, do that, don't do this. In our schools and colleges, universities, we just come and lecture to our students. Just take it as I say. No, that is the, not the right way of developing the right kind of intellectual property or the great intellectual resource. We have to have an environment in a classroom, in an organization, where people can think freely, talk freely, have open mind discussion, can give reasons, can, can say no to, to something which they don't like. If you have that, that that's when you start the whole process of developing the intellectual property or the right thinking, the critical thinking. This is something we have to really imbibe. Uh, as a nation, we haven't done that. Unfortunately, the, the way our schooling is uh, taken from British period or their whole sort of method of delivery and learning, that, that has not gone too far, as opposed to the other Western countries like the United States. But it doesn't, it, it is not the case that we didn't have it in the past. We had very open mind uh, sort of culture and a, and a culture of reasoning and, and, and discussions. If you go 17th century, 16th century, 18th century, we, we were great. But then somehow this feudalistic culture, this my way culture, has, has, has really killed the, the very instinct of developing the great intellectual resource. And this is something that really, really, in my uh, sort of own uh, thoughts, we have to uh, uh, discuss today. I know a lot of sessions are planned and on, uh, on I, uh, IPRs and TRIPS agreements and agriculture issues and other things. But the first thought is how to develop it. We are talking of protecting it, but unless you have it, what are you protecting? We lag behind greatly, hugely, in our patents. R&D, level of R&D. The citations that our professors have in Western journals. We lack behind in that. So it will come when you have free thinking, open mind. Best research comes in an open environment, the culture I talked about. And this is first sort of thought which comes to our mind today when we uh, think of uh, commemorating and celebrating this intellectual property day, the 26th of April. And it is all the more important in a country like ours to remind this day in schools and colleges because we need to really uh, lay a great uh, focus in developing that environment and culture of critical thinking. Science is the key. Without science, you don't develop. I don't mean everybody has to be a scientist. What I meant by that is you have to have a scientific thinking. It is the scientific thinking, design thinking, which will enable us to solve our problems, 
which will enable us to see things very critically in a very transparent manner. We somehow willy nilly don't do that. Whatever may be the reasons, we don't do that. And it's very sad. When I see young people in the universities not walking on that path, it's very sad. Because that's a loss of the country. I'm not talking about GDP as such, but I'm talking about the countries as a whole becoming the world leader. GDP is one part. There are many sides of growth. When you talk about preserving it, once you had, in fact, you become, you, you, you would be more, you will be compelled to pr protect it. You'll be motivated to protect your intellectual property once you have it more and more and more of it. Because then, then there will be a realization, there will be awareness that we, we, had, we had it and then somebody has taken it away, somebody is stalling it. Like, you know, in, in, in the field of agriculture, I think there's a session, uh, we have been reading how the turmeric uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, right, property rights is being taken, is being rather being claimed by United States and its multinational companies. So there are many, many examples, many, many examples. So protecting it is equally important. There's no point in having it if you don't protect it. I come from Delhi University and we have a lot of labs and, and, and uh, a lot of professors are doing great work in biotechnology and many, many other areas. But we have not been able to protect our, the, the, the research being done by them. We lack that process, that, that that whole culture of protecting it. I was in a committee, uh, a big one, uh, where a lot of crores of uh, project uh, were given. And when I looked at for two, three years in that committee, I found a lot of money was given to IIT professors. And they did wonderful research, but they left at that. And they just publish few papers and that's all. They're, they're happy, publish papers, and they became full professor a little early. Oh, I'm great. But what about patents, protection? They don't care about it. I'm talking about IITs, I mean, not small universities. And then the private multinational companies take that away and claim it at their own. Professor Vyas is there, he has worked in multinational companies and in biotech area. I saw firsthand in that committee and I said, what is going on in the country? It was in the, it was in the field of oil, ONGC. And I'm sure you, you know how Reliance and many other private multinational companies are sort of playing games in the, in the field of oil. Very, very sad. And I'm talking about a great lot of crores and crores and crores of money being spent and given to IIT's professors and they do research and, and that's it. And then if I go a step further, tell you the story, how our since the issue is also public policy today, how our policy makers with vested interest, buy technology from foreign multinational companies. The same technology travels abroad and you buy it from outside at a very high price. And our own company become substandard and sort of, uh, and they continue to use the outdated technology then because you are buying so-called advanced technology and our own companies never able to develop that 
protect that, make use of that. It's a bad, bad scenario. I first hand saw for three years, and we, we we wrote a report. It is with the, it is with the government, and we critically. I was very particular, so we have to we have to point this, we have to say this very clearly in the report. How our tax payers' money is being used, and and and, and grants are being given to professors, and they do research and. They just publish papers and that's it. And then how this whole thing, game at the global level is being played. So this is a very, uh, very, very uh, critical and important area to my mind that uh, we really have to, have to uh, uh, sort of examine. And at, at the public policy level, we have to articulate as, as to uh, how uh, our uh, in the years to come we we need to we need to act uh, without taking much time uh, literally uh, I'm, uh, we have some wonderful uh, uh, scientists and great speakers uh, uh, lined up and uh, I, uh, given the availability of my time today I have few more things lined up and I might join in between and benefit from uh, their experiences and, and their own uh, sort of uh, researches. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, the four speakers that we have would uh, uh, deliberate and articulate uh, their, their thoughts uh, on the issues that are flagged off uh, and, and enlighten us and our students and faculty will, will benefit uh, from this. Uh, with these uh, few words, I must thank Professor Vyas, Amit, our uh, deans and heads of law school and biosciences, and uh, these four wonderful speakers uh, uh, that we have invited, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sasank and Dr. Ms. Archana, Dr. Jyoti Kaul, and Santanu Day. I am thankful to all the four for uh, agreeing uh, to spare time and uh, share your experiences and thoughts with our faculty and students. I wish the symposium a great success. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your words of wisdom, sir. Uh, no doubt, uh, originality and creativity is the root of intellectual property. And I think uh, more sooner we realize that is uh, much better for our growth and development in many aspects including um, uh, now I think without much uh, ado and without much wasting of time let us move to our first technical session of the day uh, which uh, we are having uh, I, I think we are going to have uh, the first speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Sashank Maurya uh, he has been very uh, distinguished uh, uh, person from the scientific fraternity uh, he has held many positions in ICAR, um, <clears throat> Indian Council for Agricultural Research. And he has been former Assistant Director General Intellectual Property, Technology, Management and International Relations at ICAR. So with this brief introduction, I'll uh, hand over the floor uh, to Dr. Maurya. Uh, Dr. Shashank Maurya uh, has been uh, former Assistant Director General ICAR for IP Intellectual uh, property technology management international relations. His focus has been on issues in agriculture and biodiversity, a very important area in intellectual property discourse. In ICAR, he brought in much needed reforms about best intellectual property practices for research and collaboration. He is PhD doctorate in genetics from IARI, Indian Agricultural Research Institute, and a law graduate from University of Delhi. He has exposure to both lawmaking and litigation cases. And as a spokesperson of IPR issues, he has been an active participant in discussions with all kinds of stakeholders. And presently he is an independent practicing attorney. It is in this context, in fact, I met him in one of the uh, workshops that was on IP and seeds actually, uh, and basically, basically agriculture uh, issues of intellectual property and this is where uh, Dr. Maurya has graced us uh, this occasion today uh, to speak about uh, 
the the intellectual property uh, in agricultural research driven development uh, so it's over to you uh, dr maria we are eager to listen to your discourse thank you amit So you want to share screen? Uh, yeah, sorry, I have first share the screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yes, sir. Perfectly okay. Sir. You can I'll put, put in, in the presentation mode. Slide mode, yeah. Yeah. It's okay now. Am I audible? Perfectly audible, sir. And the slide is um, seen by everybody. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Amit, for giving my introduction and reviving our old contact. I would say <laughs> I like the um, remarks of the honourable Vice Chancellor, and just to keep the continuity. uh i am just remembering a few remarks from him and i'll be touching them in my presentation all right sir one thing he said was about internalizing the ip externality in our research and education system basically what he said was to invest in human capital inbuilt was the issues of transparency and accountability he talked about freedom of thinking he mentioned turmeric patent and i'll be talking about many others including turmeric cotton haldi uh, neem wheat patent rice basmati patent and all i'll be touching on them the whole issue is how do we assimilate the intellectual property dimensions in the system in research and education system particularly and then it goes on to development commercialization and so on i was happy to see that this your seminar is a collaboration between school of legal studies and school of biological studies sciences and one of my slides will tell you why i am happy to see this collaboration my topic is as on the slide but basically it is for the whole research and education system because the foundations have to be in the in research and education you mentioned amit about the ipr policy and how it says about progressively increasing ipr uh, understanding from schools onwards so let me first remember the recent history of the intellectual property rights before that my plan is basically in these three broad dimensions and i will talk about the recent history of iprs why all did it come what were the reasons science politics management whatever i'll particularly touch upon our india's two important act, acts i'm not getting into planted patent act per se but i'll be dealing with the litigation cases and the laws in the one slide only and then how do you take forward how did we take took it forward and what all is needed the, the honorable vice chancellor told about iits also the problem more of publication and not patenting i happen to be the external expert in iit delhi and we used to say about it there of course not in the meeting but otherwise you know why the for the engineers the patent act was always favorable for biology i can understand you can say for information technology also it may not be that favorable but patent act 1970 itself was so good but why was that culture not there well thankfully it is gradually building but we require much much more well if you recall the second half of the 20th century i divide this uh, second half into the decades on and onwards and i wish i can take a long time in talking about each of the decades but time doesn't permit me basically it was in the 1960s 
that the private sector in the developed world began lobbying for intellectual property rights in the developing countries. The origins were obvious. Their markets were to get saturated and they wanted markets elsewhere. Then the question of biological resources, the genetic resources came. In the Europe being small, small countries, they were having small, small gene banks or seed banks, for example. US had a big one. Everybody wanted control of genetic resources. 1980s, the Food and Agriculture Organization took the middle path of agriculture perspective. And I'll touch upon the middle path in the next slides. 1990s is the crucial, you know, these two international treaties. But then as the treaties came, people thought that, and um, the developed countries, people brought this, the issue of biodiversity prospecting. In that also, there was an element of, you know, exploiting the biodiversity of the gene rich countries. Because if we don't understand the value and worth of our biological resources, the others will um, assign a financial value according to their whims and fancies. So what we need is an understanding the value and worth of our biological resources ourselves. So as a reaction came the farmers rights and we included farmers rights in our plant variety rights law. In the early 2000s, the developing countries and the least developed countries started uniting. And then the Doha development round came. I mean, you probably will touch upon it. And India's laws came. Other issues, new came, new issues came, labor issues, environment issues. And then what was happening is as those intellectual property rights being focused more and more in different countries, including the developing countries, we realized that people are not sharing their germplasm, the plant germplasm particularly, and from the food and agriculture organization, which was, I said, as the took a middle path, they came with this international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, ITPGRFA, saying that at least for God's sake, collaborate on plant resources. FAO. Yeah, FAO came with this treaty. Then the International Agriculture Research Institute, CGIR, then ITPGRFA was limited to only 64 crops. Then Nagoya Protocol under the Biological Convention on Biological Diversity wanted to have that to cover all the biological resources, including animal diversity and so on. And then the genetic modified crops, and then the issue of fair and reasonable, fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory terms of licensing front. So many things, you know, and uh, obviously I'll not be able to talk on everything but that's in brief you know the developments and what was the basic message in these developments the basic see all this 19 second half of the last century if you see only cbd and wto were the main two things you know that posed challenges of growth and development new challenges of growth and development along with additional international commitments and I am trying to list here the international commitments. You have to conserve environment and biodiversity. You have to value it. You have to monitor it. You have to honor others' claims of intellectual property. You have um, the requirements of stringent quality standards were there. The new requirements of international trade. I mean, think people were not sharing the genetic resources, or at least there should be a mechanism for facilitated access to genetic resources. I have talked about. ITPGRF and Nagoya protocol. And then you have to collaborate on mutually agreed terms, then access and benefit sharing and those kind of arrangements and so on. I mean, what is the basic message from all these additional international commitments and all new challenges for growth and development of any nation? You need a paradigm shift in countries overall approach to growth and development. And the honorable vice chancellor very rightly said in his old lucid manner, well, this is just to tell you about what is the situation in agriculture. See, on the top right, you see the right red font. There are people who are passionate about the environmental perspective of natural resources. On the bottom left in the red font, that is the other extreme. There are people with strong feelings towards much faster realization of the agroeconomic value in natural resources. I mean, they want to generate income. 
so on one extreme was of people who were interested in conservation and ecology the other end was interested in commerce and economics and see the two extremes have to be bridged or brought together through understanding of the humanities which the honorable vice chancellor also said just to tell you who were the people interested in conservation ecology they were developing countries they were non government organizations and sympathetic academics like you and i we all we all for these sympathetic academics and developing countries and ngos the goal was that we should access have access to ip facilitated access or whatever access to ip is must when open access has come but the what were the characteristics of this group they were smaller people in number they were weaker they had fewer resources on the other extreme were the industry associations the multinational enterprises the organization for economic cooperation and development and they wanted to ration the ip that was the goal and they were larger in number strength stronger and much more resources i mean poor agriculture comes somewhere in the middle of that that's why i said you know so the government have to pay play the role of a regulator the facilitator and a promoter they have to walk the middle path so so is same is the situation with pharma and i'm sure ms jakhar will talk be talking about it relating it to covid so what are the critical issues in agriculture most critical issue is imparting ecological integrity for sustainability the second generation problems are coming in agriculture conservation agriculture word has been used and so on we have to reduce the cost for the farmers <coughs> we have to announce their income you know about the farmers protests climate change risks is also there so mitigate those risks <coughs> today you know the risks are multiplying ecological risks financial risks social risks with these legal issues and the uncertainties of technology sometimes because they have to in agriculture you have to be a location specific technologies with the diversity of agriculture look uh, climate for micro niches for micro location you have to think about what are the agriculture requirements so the technical legal dimensions have also become one thing for reduction of risks and i related to the farmers protests the farmers welfare needs an appreciation of both fairness as well as efficiency and we are all learning from this farmers protests ipr and commercialization patenting is okay that is needed but the question is in what manner you internalize this externality the role of government i public sector i said that even for the any education system be it a private university because before going into access of commercialization we have to build the human capital as the one honorable vice chancellor said so, so alongside the commercialization and ip issue patenting and all issues you have to think about the ethical and social issues as well access to biological resources have facilitated the access is okay but at the same time you have to promote the growth of biodiversity imagine i was talking about biological biodiversity prospecting nature's bio bounty somebody uses it as a private property how ethical it is is it the so the question is a whole issue of biodiversity management not too much of commercialization crash commercialization can if impact the social structures and sustainability investment in research in this country is almost 0.75% of the gdp if you as a education sector go too much into commercialization then the whole issue of survival of public sector research and development do the remon mm, appreciating the public good dimensions then the indigenous people's rights community rights and vital 
the education of students and public, which I said. Touching among the plant variety and farmers rights act. Well, I call these four free, as I said on the left side, say on the left side, as the four essential elements of the law. Farmers rights, researchers rights, extant variety, essentially derived varieties. I'll not go into the details, probably Jyoti will do it. But these are the basic essential salient features of the law. Of course, for new variety rights are there, you need to have the testing requirements of distinctness, uniformity and stability. What are the issues in that? The issue of benefit sharing with the original suppliers of original material, the farmers who have given their um, farmers varieties and so on. Earlier we used to say, you know, we believed in Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. Bird is, you know, it's a one family. We believed in free availability of germplas. But then said, no, free availability is fine. But why should it be for free of charge? So the question is, what kind of value should you should assign? Is grass commercialization important? Or is the development of the human capital of the farmers, of agriculture, of environment and biodiversity is important? I'm balancing all these things is so important. For that, we have to appreciate the interdependence. We also need materials from others. So now in the International Treaty on Plant Gender Resources for Food and Agriculture, we agreed only on 64 crops. There's a disagreement on soybean from China. We had our reservations, sugarcane and so on. So the question is understanding your germplas, understanding your plant resources, classifying that your plant resources. Where do you use your plant resources? For culinary purposes, purposes? for curative pharma purposes, and then for climate related purposes, the three C's I call them, culinary, curative, and climate. Classifying them, understanding the elements in the international treaty, which is again a legally binding treaty. And then, because we are interdependent, it's an interdependent world, we have to think about harnessing the synergies, accelerating the synergies. Our law has been unique because Article 27.3b of TRIPS provided us the flexibility. We have attempted to balance the interests of both breeders and farmers. A good progress in terms of achievements, in terms of application, submission of application, registration, but much more needs to be done. Achieve much more needs, I'll retread that because there are several issues. I wish I could just go on talking about this law only because I am in love with this law. And there are issues. Now we have here think of, of farmers' varieties, farmer owners' rights. Brazil, they think of the stewardship of farmers. What have been the difference in the Brazil, in India? How do we take this law forward? There have been sentiments attached for several kinds of provisions in this law. I'll not go into this. At the end of the day, you know. Farmers want the quality of the seed, both from the point of distinctness, uniformity and stability, as well as from other points like germinability, viability, the quality of seed, you know, healthy seed, which can give a good crop. That only will give farmers confidence. If we give the right varieties with the better good seed quality, which is um, established through the distinctness, uniformity and stability, and value for cultivation and use, probably Jyoti will tell about it. Academia will also have confidence, breeders' confidence. And industry also, if it is in research, industry's confidence will also be there if we have the quality of varieties and seeds. The question is the impact of UPOF, the international law, which is there in about 76 countries, total about 76 members, 96 members total. Whereas CBD is 194 plus about 196 members probably, and TRIPS WTO has 163 members probably. So CBD is a more, much more universal agreement. So the question is, there may, um, can be deficient difficulties in our law, but then we have to law making and law amending also has to be an ongoing exercise. What kind of research is there in this law? Just reaction? No. Excellent research work has come from abroad. I wish I could talk about each of those theses from Max Planck Institute Munich and University of Reading and 
swan from switzerland on traditional knowledge i think switzerland or finland or some scandinavian country i'm forgetting that i mean lot of work is needed but then let me come to india's biological diversity yeah. is section 3 to 7 and then section 40 i consider them the most important it tries to distinguish between the whole issue is about access to biological diversity and then benefit sharing with the providers of the biodiversity so obviously those days we created a distinction between an indian and non indian entity and then if you're transferring results to another country another agency then you need an approval of the national biodiversity authority but then we thought that in this uh, wish for ipr the collaborative research to harness energies should not get affected so a proper provision for facilitating collaborative research was there of course for application of ipr approval of nba is required intimation to state biodiversity boards etc is required for obtaining the biological resources but there are many other commodities you know which is already in the trade so section 40 on exam some exemption to normally traded commodities which number has grown sir so there are guidelines developed in 2014 about access to biological resources and then we also have the center for biodiversity and policy and law but making a law is one thing implementation is a different thing and these two laws these were a first exposure i mean we need to keep on thinking where lies the possibility for amending it start with amending the rules and regulations which are easy to amend what are the difficulties in the plant variety law mechanism for workable benefit sharing policies with the farmers is it easy the same issue in biological diversity law also we are talking about commercialization of plant varieties by scientists how the small sort farmers will participate because their farmers varieties are also protected under the law section 39 talks about expected performance for the far injure an insurance for the farmers from the breeders is it easy how do you implement it there are issues in essential biological diversity also you may be knowing about some of few knowing of the broccoli patent tomato patent all those issues are also there i wish i mean i should keep on talking but then coming to difficulties in biological diversity act wild diversity act what we need is enhancing sustainable use of biological resources while managing the biodiversity available in india the whole issue here as in the ppr act of access and benefit sharing challenges are there see we talked about patents the percentage of commercialized patents is so less 1% 2% 3% max 10% maybe should it restrict research and development how do we assimilate the ip dimension that is the big issue the definition of foreign entity in section 3 one thing could be yes and as the, as per the company act we can think about equity of 51% but should, can we do that because this is also you know changing it can change from one kind of industry to another kind of industry so these are issues you know for amending the law the industry says when the we pay goods and services tax why additional tax i mean it is a responsibility for the mining industry also we impose a responsibility for rehabilitation of the mined lands these laws are good but there is an impediment in ease of doing business and i am hearing you know people are avoiding the nba process national biodiversity authority i mean you may have taken it from the bio, natural environment but you don't declare that i have taken from say x university or x research institute what should we do about such difficulties and then uh, today the question is coming out say digital sequence information you have the gene gene sequences i can synthesize and do everything so there are challenges of course germplasm will always be required i so digital sequence information versus actual plant germplasm or animal germplasm so because of the techno advances in technology in i'll take in information technology 
copying and all those things piracy everything happens in it also because of the advances in technology there is a redundancy also increasing how do we manage that see bio piracy happens whenever there is an associ it's association with the traditional knowledge i got associated with indian institute of technology durki i was limiting myself to the uh, traditional knowledge in agriculture and some with the traditional knowledge digital library of csir of pharma archana jakhad may be talking about it but see we have so much of traditional knowledge in all fields and i have given you so many examples here i learned it from while my interaction with, uh, with my while my intera interacting with the iit durki and talking in a meeting of the uh, ipr chair professors that is another problem ipr chair professors are so very limited mostly going to law universities not going much to the science universities the honorable vice chancellor is in delhi university the national ipr chair is not there we need to think all those things about so the whole issue is you know understanding from knowledge to innovations to intellectual property to rights to benefit society i made this slide long back you know for the school students i should be finishing now basically here you know a boy doing an excellent job in america his mother in the ashram in krishikesh asking her that your uncle is also not interested in the in the farmland where pomegranates are being grown and she want so he thought i can get the us job any time let me go and try this and then he does all kind of things you know and how he comes to agri tourism student education getting the pomegranate harvested by the students and so on it's a very interesting story even handling the missile muscle man you see the man on the left bottom in the mustaches because he was copying his ex new extracting machine so police also is today is aware about the ipr issues so when he got it patented the use extracting machines and then trademark slogans everything i wish i could say speak and speak on this this is about the laws there is a message in each law basically the first three biodiversity ppfr and patent act they all talk about the traceability the competition act so much of uh, damages have been awarded but they do are still locked in the litigation because so we have to appreciate the enforcement also takes time itpj fa nagoya i said we need a classification of biological resources you classify and then give it for okay this also we open this also we open this also keep on opening it be open hearted seed bill is not coming the research is not there in policy and legal research cotton patent in transgenic cotton we know about basmati but transgenic cotton patent we got it revoked in india in the us without even spending a penny it was wrongly granted in india we got it revoked we wanted to get it revoked on the basis of lack of prior art but the government preferred to do it on under section 66 and prejudicial to public interest but in us 16 us lawyers descended on to udyog bhavan you know to defend this patent but we presented the lack of uh, because genetic transformation process we said is a transgender textbook method and it was recorded without any effort in us the agrasitas transgenic patent the basmati patent at the end of the uh, the litigation only three grain quality patents were left the others were all um, withdrawn but and we really felt the lack of the problem in our quality and quality, qu quantity and quality of research data the case was already in the us courts and we were building more and more data the neem patent again the technology gap analysis issue comes if the patent is not on neem it was on a point specific point on stability and uh, of the uh, active ingredient so the white space analysis patent landscaping and all those issues the haldi patent the vice, vice chancellor mentioned we need traditional knowledge document management in all those different science fields with that i talked about the wheat for farmers it is for basically a bis at a molecular level the patent is there but basically for biscuit making now an ngo wanted us to chase it and challenge it in the us but we got it uh, disposed of from the supreme court we said, uh, we took a stand that yes it is not a priority it is not worth the time effort and money to go chase and challenge every patent 
they will be patenting everything we should um, be very clear you know okay haldi patent is a question of prestige of the traditional knowledge basmati patent it's a question of economic stakes but we cannot be changing and challenging we have limited resources we have to do better things the sorghum variety case <coughs> we are having lack of research techno legal skills in the research system which is why i said ipr professor chair in here i was you know in the delhi literature festival as the the first one in oberoi maidens now i think four or five literature festival in the inaugural session you know the chief financial officer of the uh, rajni gandha pan masala i thought they are basically aggregators not much novelty innovation and that he pleaded before honorable hamid ansari ji that we should have hundreds of ipr chair of professor mm -hmm. the commercialization we need a lot of brainstorming the equivalent of bedol act is not coming so we need law litigation lesson i wish i can go and on and on but what happened in I icr when uh, long back when i was trying to tell them people were so um uh, opposing uh, the ipr and then you know in my par um, participants you know i posed the question in their application form i gave them the question ipr is one a necessary evil the two a necessary good three absolutely necessary four absolutely ne unnecessary believe me majority said in the initial stage of the program that is a necessary evil <laughs> my challenge in those in three hours three days was that by the time by the end of the uh, program after 3 days when it's all over they should change their the choice and believe me in majority of the cases 60% of my programs later the majority frequency used to be ipr is a necessary good and then in 30% of the cases 70% that 30% of the cases they said ipr is absolutely necessary i said no even the adjective is not required absolutely only it's a necessity the question is how do you assimilate how do you internalize this externality these whole dimensions of recognizing protecting licensing education networking ultimately the services of societies i should i wish i could talk about each and every one, one thing all this understanding in our research and education system and i would say the law people have to take care of it this is an interesting thing you know i was telling you know why i was happy to say about the collaboration between your school of biological sciences and school of law you, uh, you know i went to uh, australia university of armadale people and the conference on was on the title environmental humanities conference imagine the three components of the uh, seven days conference six six days conference i was in the third conference on colloquium in seed banks and cultural interests you know how do they debate the subject we keep on giving these introductory lectures there were six speakers ip law professors i was taken on board as an ip law professor and six were conservation biologists from the top most botanic gardens of the world q tokyo new zealand australia south africa and so on six conservation biologists six ipr professors each given 10 minutes and they were already given before they were reaching their four questions you address the answer to these four questions in 10 minutes we address them and then they also had given us 16 more questions and we talked about those 16 questions later for 4 hours the basic objective was that i mean it was funded by a private company for prospecting the biodiversity and how do you do that so the question basically was in this 16 questions and in the long discussion for 4 hours you know what will be conflicts etc and issues arising in the next 50 years that is the kind of scoping uh, paper they were developing you know so that kind of discussions are required my final slide the law pe people you know law has become quite glamorous law people have started doing iprs we have to trigger and shape the debates we have to ignite minds we have to build capacities you may be given it as a public good but we must know and our slogan should be thou shall not lose ip by ignorance i end here thank you very much uh thank you dr morya it has been a wonderful uh, enriching experience of listening to you and i think we can go on and on with your you know it's such a long and vast experience uh, i hope uh, like me all of you would have actually enriched in your knowledge and uh, uh, and, and by 
uh, the, the thorough discourse which Dr. Moria has given us today. Uh, if there are any questions at the moment, uh, we, you know, I can ask right away. Otherwise, we can start with the next speaker and perhaps we can, at the end of these two lectures, we'll be having all the question answers. Are there any questions from any of the panelists first? Question to Dr. Sashank Maurya's discourse. I think uh, if you have any questions to Dr. Maurya's uh, thorough presentation, I, I think, I, think uh, I, I will take uh, word from you that you will be coming with us again and again, actually, uh, taking, uh, you know, enriching and enri being enriched from your knowledge and the experiences you have in the agricultural and seed sector, sir. I hope uh, you will be coming coming uh, on board with us uh, in further discourses as well. So as uh, as Dr. Bias suggests, I think we should uh, take the questions uh, in the uh, in the end of the session uh, by Dr. by Ms. Archana Jatka. Uh, Associate Secretary General, uh, Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance. Uh, before I go to her, I would like to briefly introduce uh, Ms. Archana Jatka. Uh, uh, Ms. Archana Jatka is currently Associate Secretary General in Pharmaceutical Alliance. Uh, she has a very strong passion for healthcare and education sector. Currently, she is the Associate Secretary General of the Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance. At IPA, she looks at international trade and re regulatory affairs with an objective to develop and execute a global and national strategic approach for, for the pharma sector. Uh, Ms. Alchina has been working with governments, research and policy community and regulations, regulators in India, Geneva, USA, South Asia, European Union, BRICS countries, with intergovernmental agencies, the WTO, World Trade Organization, UNCTAD, World Bank, Common, Commonwealth Secretariat, UNDP, industry associations globally. Among others, she has conceptualized, stayed and implemented capacity building training programs on intellectual property rights and related WTO issues, as well as in the technology diplomacy program for scientists, technologists of government of India. She is an alumnus of Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University US and LLM International Economic Law from University of Kent, United Kingdom. It is an absolute pleasure, uh, Ms. Jatka, to have you with us today. And it was an absolute privilege, actually, to listen to you in one of your discourses, which uh, was hosted by School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, APG Star University. And that is how I got introduced to your uh, wisdom and your knowledge. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you today. Uh, and it, oh, you know, the floor is oh, you know, give, open for your discourse now. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor. I, I hope you're able to hear me properly. Yes, yes. We are and perfect. You're also able to see me, right? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, my slides. The slide is coming. Uh, and it is on slide mode. Please go on, ma'am. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just keep my video off so that we have a good bandwidth. Uh, for this discourse. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Amit. And uh, also a very, um, I feel very privileged uh, to have been invited to this uh, session, basically on, on, on the importance of IPRs and uh, also to celebrate this day, which is in the midst of a pandemic where the importance of this subject becomes all the more um, d important in this whole discourse. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor uh, of the University uh, for uh, having his uh, interesting talk on the development of IPR. And I also uh, thank Professor Moria, Dr. Moria, for his enlightening speech on, on the biodiversity. Uh, but what I 
intend to do in this in my session is to talk about the COVID pandemic that we are on in between, in the midst of it, um, and also touch upon some of the critical aspects of uh, intellectual property rights, especially the patents and what kind of impact you may have on, on, on of IPRs on the medicines, on the vaccines for COVID-19, and what sort of developments are taking place uh, you know, in this space. Um, COVID-19 is, to my mind, uh, no more an unprecedented uh, event, but I would say it's one of the greatest humanitarian challenges that we have in the modern times. And we are still learning about the virus the coronavirus and the virus is spreading at an unprecedented rate. In everyone's mind by now, um, the origin story of coronavirus seems well fixed in late 2019. Someone at the now world famous um, Yunnan seafood market in Wuhan was infected with this virus from an animal. The rest is a part of the history still in making with COVID-19 uh, spreading from the first cluster in the capital of China's Hubei province to a pandemic that has killed almost 3.1 million people so far around the world. And since this new coronavirus was first reported in Wuhan in December 2019, the infectious um, respiratory disease uh, COVID-19 has spread rapidly within China and to the neighboring countries. Um, in January 20, the first case was detected in US, which was mid-January. By January 30, India has its first case of a student in Kerala who had returned from the Wuhan University. And rest is history. We know we've undergone stringent lockdown for first 100 days last year. And life has never been the same since Corona hit us. Coronavirus pandemic has thrown up, no doubt, a grave challenge to mankind. And while the patients are being given treatment protocols, and in certain cases, they also need special respiratory care, research institutions around the world have been focusing on developing a vaccine, a cure for the disease. We have some vaccines in place, and this, this, in this slide, I've just thought I will show you how things panned out. Um, you know, from December 19 till March 21st, how the timeline has moved so fast. Now we have a couple of vaccines, which we will talk about in our later slides as well. Uh, resurgence, right now, research, there, are, there is a resurgence of COVID-19 positive cases with uh, types of variants of virus infecting a large number of people and in various parts of the world, the UK, the EU had their second wave already a, a couple of months back. Now, today uh, from last month or so, India is under a, a extreme uh, second wave that we are witnessing uh, in a in couple of days and you've seen and followed that in the news. Um, how fast it has spread, what type of variants are being cut, and there are people even detected with the reinfection giving rise to a huge, huge second wave. Um, with, with the rising cases globally, there also are in place renewed lockdowns. You know, we've seen that in, in Europe with the second wave, we've seen that now in India. And uh, there are several, several issues related to supply chain disruptions so far as the in pharmaceutical industry is concerned, I must, um, I must uh, tell you about the supply chain. Um, and you must have heard also probably last year more so that there were a lot of raw materials like the active pharmaceutical ingredients which were being supplied by China and which were the supply of which was interrupted in the big, during the pandemic, uh, early part of the pandemic last year. And there were a lot of uh, issues related to transportation due to lockdown and also uh, because of the spread of this disease. Happy to inform you that um, 
all these months the pharma industry in india has worked smoothly government and industry worked in collaboration and we have been combating uh, this pandemic from for from front and uh, been able to actually supply uninterrupted the life saving medicines not just in india but across the world uh, the situation has been very critical in last few days but the industry is seized of the issue the government is seized of the issue we are all doing what we can do the best so just as i i thought this is an important uh, context to set for and here i also wanted to sort of introduce you to uh, understand or give a snapshot of what pharma in, how indian pharma industry is and whether it has a capacity to actually combat the pandemic like situation so um a quick a quick round um of introduction to the indian indian, indian pharma industry um which is uh, being challenged by this uh, pandemic and i think um the generic pharma industry uh, has risen to the occasion and has ensured access to quality and affordable medicines to people across world uh, the industry has been at the forefront of the pandemic and has worked relentless relentlessly to ensure that there is an uninterrupted supply of life saving medicines today we have a tremendous advantage of applying learnings from last 12 to 13 months in the second wave that is being experienced in many parts of india and in the world now we understand the methodology of testing trace, tracing and treatment of covid-19 better than before and applying it when yield results when coupled with the covid appropriate behavior of population um this just to give you a snapshot the pharma industry has played a key role in driving better health, health outcomes across the world um the size of the industry today is almost 41 billion dollars with equal contribution from exports and domestic sales the industry contributes hugely um, to the employment uh, sector it employs about 2.7 million uh, people uh, across the country um, it generates those of who you follow the trade uh, law part of it uh, it's a, it's a very a uh, critical industry or strategic industry in terms that it produces a uh, annual trade surplus of about 13 billion dollar uh, in value terms uh, it is 11th largest and in uh, volume terms indian pharma industry is the third largest uh, industry you can see there's a huge gap between the value and the volume and that is uh, a debate that the industries having for quite some time on how to move up the value chain and get into r&d and innovation so that uh, we achieve a uh, first uh, five spots even in the value terms but generally um, the industry contributes almost 20% of global exports of generic industry um more relevant to the pandemic um, globally um, indian pharma has contributed in for improving public health outcomes since this is a public policy uh, session that we are doing i thought it will be good to give you some kind of uh, data uh, that you could relate to um, india all accounts for about 60% of global vaccine production it contributes about 40 to 70% of who demand for dpt vaccines um, we contribute uh, almost every third tablet in us is from india every fourth tablet that you see in uk is made in india and a uh, very interesting figure um, i have tried to uh, put together uh, about the aids patient you know which is a very relevant conversation uh, so far as the corona cases are concerned and the repurposed drug that we hear about uh, in africa the availability of this affordable uh, indian drugs uh, contributed uh, to almost a greater access 
uh, with, with 37 percent of AIDS patients receiving treatment in 2009 versus 2 percent in 2003. So Indian industry through its generic uh, uh, drugs has been able to provide much more affordability and accessibility to these uh, diseases uh, and has been contributing hugely, almost 60% in the global vaccine production. Indian pharma industry has built um, a strong manufacturing and analytical capacities over the years. It has, it has developed, I'm sorry, it has developed um, a cost efficient market and has been receiving the needs of the affordable medicines to patients across the world. Uh, one of the very critical point, and this is very relevant in the pandemic times, we still to achieve as a country universal healthcare access. Access to healthcare in India is inadequate in comparison to the size of population. Uh, about 60% of rural patients travel more than you know five to six kilometers to seek inpatient department treatment. And uh, India's doctor to nurse ratio to patient per thousand is lower than what WHO actually provides. So it's uh, extremely critical for healthy India or a thriving healthcare ecosystem. And you see um, in the last year and today we the healthcare system has been struggling, although uh, we have immense capacities, but given the population we have been, it's, it's been a daunting challenge, especially in the second wave. Now, I'm, I, this is a slide where I wanted to give you a quick look onto how industry developed and so as to enable you to understand that can Indian industry contribute, uh, you know, going forward in the pandemic and generally. So, and this will also sort of bring in forth uh, uh, the IPR angle and how in Indian industry was able to take benefit of the uh, intellectual property rights and taking forward the discussion that Dr. Moria has been uh, saying that why IPRs are so important. And um, this is solely from the perspective of Indian pharma industry. So you would see in the first uh, uh, column, you know, this is pharma 1.0. From being almost a non-existent in 1970s, the Indian pharma industry has come a long way to being one of the largest and the most advanced pharmaceutical industries in the world. And this became possible because of the Patent Act uh, of India of 1970, uh, which was one of the first patents act in independent India. Before this act came in place uh, in early 60s until 70s, um, we used to import, mostly import all the medicines. So there was very less domestic production. 1970s Patent Act had a provision for only process patent and it did not allow for patenting of the end product, which actually enabled manufacturers to develop alternative processes for proprietary products that were already in existing. And it actually led to Indian, uh, the entrepreneurs exploring pharma industry more and more and they developed a whole domestic industry you know, with a low cost processes and manufacturing. So much so that by 1990, Indian industry not just evolved to cater to its domestic population, to its domestic market, but it also started exporting to other countries. And uh, in, in this context, I would also like to sort of quickly give you a feel that in 1991, I, I don't think many of the students were uh, born during these days, but in 1991, India had launched a very giant economic reforms and stepped into globalization. These economic reforms propelled market liberalization, synergizing Indian industry with the world economy. At the same time, uh, you know, with the world economy coming, uh, the incidences in the World Economic Forum. Uh, were also worth mentioning in terms that there were 
um, you know, there used to, used to be a general agreement of trade and tariff, uh, the GATT treaty, uh, and there were rounds of negotiation that started in 1986, and many countries, including India, who are member countries, were negotiating on a number of issues during 1990, 1986 uh, to 1994. What happened is, you know, we have, so I wanted to give you a flavor here of how the WTO came into existence as a result of consistent negotiation for about nine, year, nine to 10 years in the GATT Treaty, which led to establishment of World Trade Organization, of which uh, a new element was introduced uh, in terms of intellectual property rights. So in GATT, there existed no IP issue, uh, and there was no international agreement or treaty on intellectual property rights so far as trade is concerned. Of course, WIPO related treaties existed. But WTO uh, came into existence in 1995. India liberalized uh, its economy and the results was in 1991 and the aftermath started revealing in next few years. Um, Indian pharma industry, which had an impact of this TRIPS agreement, uh, was also uh, taking advantage of several provisions, um, you know, that the TRIPS agreement or the flexibilities the TRIPS agreement granted to developing countries um, came into existence. So the growth period of from 1970s to 1990s was an interesting one, which created the entire Indian pharma industry, uh, which is so robust and so contributing, which I showed you in my previous slides, about 20%. Uh, most of these companies had evolved during this period. Going forward, you know, after 2005, um, nine, so, after 2005, the Indian Patents Act uh, was amended and product patent was introduced in India and it brought India at par with several other advanced economies. And uh, we have been uh, shaping up and, and, and the pharma uh, industry has been shaping up in accordance with these developments in IP. Um, and going forward, you know, with pharma for 2020 onwards, the next decade. Um, as a pharma industry person, I can tell you there's a lot of focus on quality. There's a lot of focus on innovation. There's a huge, huge trans digital transformation that is happening and patient centricity has come to a center stage of this whole. And when we talk about patient centricity, COVID pandemic, it all in all, uh, shows us that Indian industry is experiencing a Y2K moment uh, in its existence. And I think it's a great opportunity for uh, us in the us in industry to actually work and take India to a next level. Coming back to our main topic, um, you know, the pandemic has shown that pharma industry in, in, in India is not only catering to the needs of patients in India, but across the world. And vaccine, as I said earlier, will be vital in addressing this pandemic. And in this context, intellectual property rights play a very important role when it comes to protecting innovations. For example, patents. Uh, are intellectual property rights, which give the patent holder the right to stop others from using patented technology without their license for the duration of the patent, which is usually is 20 years. Now this right allows patent holders to develop an income stream and recoup their investment in the technology. Yet um, patents have significant implications for healthcare uh, how, uh, you would ask, how does that impact? Uh, I'll give you an example. Patent holders can refuse licenses to third parties to produce a patented medicine. This could lead to a patent holder becoming the only provider of that medicine with no con implications for its supply. And now if you relate it to say a, a, a 
pandemic situation where one vaccine is developed uh, by a company and patented and if it doesn't allow any th other company to produce we will only be left with one company producing vaccine and the demand is so huge across the world uh, what would happen uh, to that vaccine and to the supply of that vaccine and to the pandemic can be well imagined and therefore the importance of uh, intellectual property rights now one as i said one of the international agreements that deals with uh, intellectual property law uh, is the wto agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual properties uh, which is called as a trips agreement in short uh, what does the trips agreement does it provides minimum standards of protection for iprs that member countries should provide for enforcement of rights in their own territories so this is a agreement which is being negotiated by which was negotiated by the member countries india is one of the members um, and it, the result of that negotiation is the trips agreement so it is essentially a negotiated agreement between the countries among the countries and uh, therefore uh, a lot of uh, countries in the WTO are developing countries and least developed countries uh, besides the developed countries. Uh, so there was a lot of negotiations where uh, member, member countries in uh, especially the developing countries were able to carve out certain flexibilities um, you know which allowed uh, developing countries to and least developed countries to actually accommodate uh, their provisions and make transitional arrangements for implementation of trips provisions um, india for example did as i said didn't had product patent uh, before 2005 and from 1995 to 2005 um, we were given a transition period to actually bring our uh, legal provisions and the laws related to IPRs uh, in alignment with the TRIPS, WTO TRIPS agreement, uh, which we did. And if you see today, it is the Patents Amendment uh, Act of 2005, which is operational. Now, um, when I say uh, minimum standards, uh, what does that mean? Um, it means national laws of the member countries must comply with the standard IP protections and enforcement which is provided in the TRIPS agreement. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, one is uh, patent protection, say for any pharma products, the minimum term has to be 20 years. So all the, com all the member countries who are uh, uh, members of WTO TRIPS agreement the protection period for patent trade products is 20 years. Now, another example, and this is an interesting one because uh, I'll, I'll, I, I'm sure you will relate to it. It's about the patentability criteria. You know, as I said, TRIPS agreement requires countries to make patents available for any inventions, whether products or processes, in all fields of technology without discrimination and subject to you know, three conditions of novelty, inventiveness, and industrial applicability. Now, India also has adopted that product and process patent as minimum criteria. But interestingly, we also have put in place a provision which is very famously called as Section 3D, you know, where our law prohibits the grant of patents to new forms of known substances that do not result in the enhanced efficacy. Now, we provide for patents and pro, uh, pat uh, product patent and process patents as required by the TRIPS agreement. But at the same time, we have an additional condition where we think that, you know, unless your patent is a genuine patent, a genuine three steps of inven inventiveness, novelty, and an industrial ap applicability has been followed with a enhanced efficacy patent will not be granted so countries are actually given this flexibility of you know adopting the provisions of trips agreement which suits the needs of their country and there's a very famous case 
that actually challenged the constitutionality of, of Section 3D uh, back in 2008. And uh, students of law may like to go back and check on the judgment. Uh, it's a very beautifully written judgment by Supreme Court. Um, the, it's, it's famously was a, a cancer medicine of uh, Novartis and uh, which uh, basically said that Section 3D com is compli TRIPS compliant and India complies fully well with the TRIPS agreement. And uh, basically Section 3D is an effective bulwark against evergreening. Uh, you must have heard this word evergreening. It's referred to um, as the practice uh, whereby pharmaceutical companies extend the patent life of a drug by obtaining additional 20 year patents for minor reformulations or other iterations of the drug, you know, without necessarily increasing the therapeutic efficacy. So if you go to say US, you will see a lot of evergreening happening. Uh, and therefore they keep challenging India section 3D, uh, which is like a holy cow to us in the pharma industry so far. So I wanted to give you that flavor of uh, how TRIPS flexibilities have been implemented in the Indian Patents Act and how um, we have been able to adopt uh, it to our advantage. Now, um, pharma relevant flexibilities are also uh, you know allowed which can be used during the covid-19 situation and there are provisions which allow actually country uh, to take necessary uh, uh, action uh, for protection of essential uh, security interest and also uh, for health security um, interest now uh, there are a couple of more interesting flexibilities that i wanted to talk to you about and we will you know, the reason why I'm taking this uh, selective ones is that I'm going to connect all this to a COVID pandemic situation and the conversations that are happening at the global level vis-a-vis uh, -vis these provisions. So there's a very uh, interesting provision, you know, uh, TRIPS provides, um, as I said, space uh, to countries to address monopoly actions, you know, through issue of compulsory license and exceptions to these rights um, are through regulatory approvals, you know, or to experiment and use. So what I, I exactly is uh, compulsory licensing? It basically allows state, uh, meaning country, to permit a third party to produce patented invention. As I said, if you are a patent holder, you, do, you block the third party from using the patent, right? Now, by, through compulsory licensing, countries can actually uh, permit third party to produce patented invention. Um, there are examples uh, you know, of medicines and there are several conditions which are being laid down um, in, in the TRIPS uh, agreement on how and when compulsory licensing can be issued. Now, this is a very interesting provision, um, but what happens is issuing compulsory licensing mostly ends with a lot of political rhetoric, practically speaking and threat of trade retaliation and investment red flags, you know. And uh, you would recall uh, the grant of the first compulsory license in India, uh, which met with a lot of resistance and litigation in various forums. And it took seven years to get the final verdict from Supreme Court of India. Um, so as you say, it, all this is very procedural and there are procedural delays that can may not be so greatly useful in this pandemic situation. So this is, these are the ideas I'm throwing at you. We're going to discuss as students of law, as faculties from different uh, uh, schools, you know. And compulsory license uh, in this global uh, pandemic situation, there are countries who have, I, I have listed the acts and the countries which have been trying to use these, uh, you know, methods flexibilities uh, to the advantage of their own thing. Now there is very interesting uh, concept. Uh, I'm not sure if it is provided uh, exclusively or explicitly in the TRIPS agreement is of voluntary licensing. And uh, voluntary licensing, this is another aspect, you know, or way of looking it from the perspective 
of pooling of resources, you know, or voluntary licensing. So even before the uh, uh, this pandemic, you know, there is a very famous uh, company called Gilead, which is now very famous because of the Remdesivir that you hear every hour. But Gilead uh, developed uh, uh, hepatitis C medicine. Uh, back a couple of years back and they had companies across the world this hepatitis B vaccine world over because it was not a pandemic but a epidemic in several countries so uh, it's a voluntary licensing is basically licensing by the innovator company to other companies to scale up the production and sort of provide access to these vaccines. Now, this has been very, very active uh, in, in the pandemic times. Uh, you've heard about a very, a very uh, famous uh, drug now, Remdesivir, which is also uh, uh, used as a treatment protocol in uh, COVID-19. It is a, a Gilead product and uh, Gilead has, been, has issued voluntary licensing for this uh, repurposed drug. Uh, to s several companies and that is why you are being able to sort of treat COVID uh, in combination with rem Remdesivir a lot. So this is another interesting um, route to combat pandemic. So as I said, compulsory licensing, voluntary licensing, we've seen. Uh, these are some of the routes. Now, what is happening is in this international emergency situation, are these remedies which we talked about, say compulsory licensing, if, if a country allows compulsory licensing of a certain product or a vaccine and then able to provide it to uh, its population, is that a good idea or a voluntary licensing is a good idea? Or the key question that I'm trying to raise here is, are the provisions of TRIPS agreement adi adequate um, to address this fast changing landscape of COVID-19? And it is important to note that most diagnostic kits, therapeutics, medical devices used in the containment and the treatment of COVID-19 uh, are facing or would face IPR barriers from copyrights from industrial de designs, patents, uh, and, and trade secrets. So use of compulsory license, which has been identified as most uh, significant flexibility in addressing this pandemic is confined to patented products or processes as per the provisions of uh, Article 31 and 31 bis of uh, I, uh, of TRIPS agreement, other IPRs, um, you know, do not have such wide uh, limitations. Um, you would see um, f further even compulsory licensing provisions, as I said, are quite deficient in addressing the pandemic situation uh, because of a lot of procedural delays that it brings in. I'll give you a very small example, the Article 31 of TRIPS, it requires countries to put in place um, a mechanism to seek voluntary license for a period of time. In India, it is six months and only there after that a compulsory license can be issued. So even in situations of national emergency or extreme urgency or, you know, or public non-commercial use where the right holder may be notified later, a determination of uh, adequate remuneration for right holder have to be made and this has to be this is also open to judicial review. Now, all this slows down the implementation of this important flexibility. And besides that provision envisages, uh, you know, the use of compulsory license only to uh, predominantly meet domestic requirement. So the remedies available in trips uh, may not necessarily be enough. Uh, and this is so because TRIPS agreement does not visualize this kind of a pandemic situation where world was at a risk. Remember, it's an agreement which was negotiated by the member countries in 1990s to 95. So 
nobody foresees a pandemic and the inability of even one country to address pandemic due to patent protection can have a negative externality for the whole world so if even if i take care of my country there is another country uh, under the pandemic situation i will be impacted so the nature of the problem we are talking is huge and uh, the agreement uh, of trips may not necessarily provide you the solution now um, there was a, you know in in article 31 which talks about compulsory license um, there's a small uh, a pro additional provision was inserted as an outcome of the doha declaration on trips agreement and public health uh, which allowed issue of compulsory license to enable supply to countries that may not have the capacity to produce pharmaceutical products. And um, this is mostly, uh, you may like to think of uh, uh, some of the African countries who do not have a manufacturing capacity, but would need medicines, uh, not just vaccines in the pandemic. And for such countries, this provision was created and, but can, can this provision be used during the um, pandemic times? Uh, it's also not with uh, so on. So um, it would be suffice to say that procedural complexities of implementing, uh, you know, provisions of compulsory licensing makes its application extremely difficult, if not impossible, and can be effective barrier to access. So it is therefore important to revisit the legal framework of protection of inventions uh, because COVID-19 is a threat to the world at large and no country can be immune to its effect. And it is critical that IPRs do not block the, these critical medicines and other devices you know, required. So um, what do we do? Uh, you know, I wanted to bring you to this point, so we are stuck. So what countries did, uh, and especially South Africa, which and India, they came together and they made a proposal in the TRIPS Council at the WTA for a TRIPS waiver. Uh, what they want to do is if you, with the waiver in position, you know, countries would be would avoid procedural and administrative delays in addressing IP barriers and therefore will be free to decide the interventions required to enable domestic production, import and export of you know, concerned products without any commitment to follow the complex procedure which is set out in the TRIPS agreement and yet not be in any kind of a WTO dispute and dragged in the dispute settlement body. So um, the type of waiver that uh, South Africa and India has put in place and which is backed by several countries uh, across the world, um, all those being opposed by the uh, developed countries like the US and the EU, uh, there are many countries who are also backing up. So this is a very live discussion at the moment in the WTO where um, We've tabled a, a waiver in place and we want this TRIPS waiver, uh, you know, to avoid procedural and administrative delay. Uh, and uh, it will also allow countries to take measures uh, which are suitable for their conditions, for their population. And most importantly, you know, the idea is that the waiver will help in increasing the accessibility and affordability of vaccines, diagnostics, and what you have. Um, so this is a live talk uh, debate of in the TRIPS Council. Students can uh, follow this uh, uh, at the WTO website. Um, now, as I said, at present, um, there is no cure for COVID-19. Research is, uh, however, ongoing and is aimed at development of vaccines and uh, uh, also for repurposing of the existing patented drugs. And one such uh, ex uh, repurposed drug that we hear today is remdesivir and favipavir for treatment of the illness. Uh, in addition, 
developing uh, to developing vaccines attempts are also uh, develop new drugs you know repurposing of existing therapies um, many of them are patented products uh, and how how um, this can be ramped up you know to bring it to billions of doses which is vital now and as i said previously gilead has signed non exclusive voluntary licensing agreements with at least seven of the indian companies for production of remdesivir and for distribution in or not just in india but almost 127 countries and this would be for the period of, of you know um of, uh, until the public health emergency is addressed so uh, a huge huge leap in terms of uh, accessibility uh, uh, and the pandemic vaccine is concerned uh, now i just wanted to also leave with you a flavor of some of the covid-19 vaccines which are present uh, uh oxford uh, Zene astrazeneca uh, which is um, you know manufactured in india by the serum institute they have a license to manufacture uh, moderna and pfizer they're not they are uh, in us they've not been granted uh, approval uh, till now in india uh, sputnik 5 this has been marketed uh, and they've got an approval in india and dr reddy's lab would be uh, bringing it out anytime soon uh, so and we have bharat biotech of course uh, uh, indigenous uh, vaccine now there are several uh, other vaccines some of them uh, are indigenous some of them are from outside india uh, this is a, a, a list of some of the vaccines one of the indigenous uh, vaccines that you would see in coming days uh, coming months would be from zydus cadila zycovid it's in the first third phase of clinical trial and uh, a very interesting vaccine in terms that it is a dna vaccine uh, and would be able to therefore people say i am not a, uh, from the science side but they say that the adaptability would be higher for the variants uh, so a vaccine to actually watch an indian indigenous vaccine um, and um, so i mean i know now you must be questioning yourself where do we go from here okay fine we have nice iprs we have great patents acts everything in place and we still not you know there and we still grappling with the pandemic situation and what is the indian pharma industry is doing right in all this now in all this one of the biggest thing is time is the essence when we talk of covid-19 and therefore we would also need to look at the timeline during which this waiver will become active that i spoke about that's one option in the hands of the country especially the developing and the least developed countries to sort of back it up and use it uh, and in this context uh, the proposal from south africa and india it provides a good option uh, ensuring timely medicines diagnostics and treatment that would be key in defeating the spread um, there's a very interesting option that we have is in the repurposing of drugs another uh, uh, you know price it's a priceless ability to save time and millions of dollars in drug research so what happens uh, for example in a country where healthcare and medical resource systems are not very strong repurposing of the existing pharma drugs is important and um, this also becomes integral part of government's investment into the preparedness of future health threats you know um, and uh, from the business angle companies usually are interested to invest you know investors who are deeply into r&d supporting uh, they would be interested in this kind of uh, arrangements and it also saves millions of rupees you know um, for uh, and make it accessible to the patients from diseases that there is no cure present at the moment so all in all you know you've got a trips play trips waiver you have compulsory licensing you have voluntary licensing you have repurposing of drugs as options and all these are intrinsically related to the iprs and the provisions which are laid out not just in indian uh, jurisdiction or indian legislations but it is the worldwide global 
um, uh, agreement on TRIPS agreement on uh, intellectual property rights where the trade will of vaccines will happen, you know. So the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, it becomes extremely critical when we talk about vaccines in current situation and also going forward. So to my mind, and as has also been um, reiterated and uh, said several times by our prime minister that global cooperation is a key and equitable access of vaccines across countries will play a huge, huge role. Governments in different parts of the world are investing in research and development, whereas all pharma companies have risen to the occasion to combat this pandemic. Now, uh, a very uh, question that probably comes to your mind. So where, what is that Indian pharma industry is doing? So if, if there are a couple of companies who are actually doing R&D and also coming out with their own vaccines. Uh, we have a large number of companies who are actually ramping up production of repurposed drugs, say the Remdesivir. And uh, there are several more companies who are actually going to work again on the vaccine generics, uh, you know, version. So if uh, innovation happens in any part of the world, India is a place and the Indian industry is a place which will actually ramp up the production. So it is a factory or the pharmacy of the world, whether you talk of vaccines and whether you talk of any other medicines or drugs. So literally, you know, in this pandemic situation, uh, the Indian industry has actually showed its commitment and true to its you know, earlier I used to hear this pharmacy of the world thing, the expression, but it was tough to relate. The pandemic time being a part of the industry and I have seen how we have catered to more than 220 countries, you know, in this one year by providing medicines uninterruptedly and truly, truly become a reliable and a dependable partner uh, of countries and the patients in need. So pharmacy of the world is something that will take India forward. Of course, there's a lot of emphasis on innovation and R&D happening now so that we do not just remain a generic industry, but enhance our value and start moving uh, and become one of the uh, countries with a large number of innovator drugs. So having said that, I'll end my talk here. I'm happy to take questions and I hope you found this session useful. Feel free to uh, put me a question now or maybe even mail me. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Uh, over to you, Professor. I think a lot of applauds uh, we owe to you for such a splendid, intensive and uh, eloquent uh, presentation, Madam Jatka. It has been wonderful to listen to you. And I think uh, likewise, everyone here present here would have benefited from your eloquent lecture. Um, I, I asked you to actually cover the Indian and the, uh, the, the global uh, developments in IPR and you have perfectly, and it very timely you have ended the session. I think uh, without much ado, I would uh, open the session for question and answer. There are one couple of questions uh, coming for one for Dr. Moria, one for Madam Jatka. But if there are other questions, uh, all of you are encouraged to put in, uh, please. Uh, Dr. Moria, you have a question from one of my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Atul Kathet. What about livestock? He's asking why they are not getting geographical tagging. So geographical indications, actually, uh, he's asking about livestock. Uh, so this is to you, so. Well, <clears throat> like uh, we have the law for plant varieties, which includes varieties from the scientists as well as from the farmers. We did talk about, uh, long back about a law for livestock breeders also. But then, you know, a lot of initiative has to come from the animal science people also. 
that's one thing but not to say limited to this much only now what do you do? one thing is that you know there are small small pockets where particular breeds are predominantly found okay now likewise the question is why not we have the livestock breeders rights first thing is as i said for the brand varieties first thing is about the precise identity of the breeds and the precise identity means an identity with a fair degree of certainty like for the plant the dus you can have distinctness here also you know from the stability here also so identifying the boundaries of the breeds is one thing it doesn't happen because a lot of cross breeding happens the mobility is there of the animal that is another dimension but there are issues in um, um, having a law on plant and livestock breeders rights and we need to really really discuss and debate on that we have done a lot but you know as i said you know the biologists veterinary scientists as well as the lawyers have to come together exactly sir that's the point unless we don't unless we do that but as a stop gap arrangement we have done something from the indian council at law like we did for plant genetic resources see you may not be getting a plant breeders rights but we have our national bureau of plant genetic resources you register your material there at least the recognition will be there so in our national bureau for animal genetic resources in karnal we are registering the livestock breeds and they are developing the breed descriptors for identity so when i till i was a member of that committee we had probably registered some 138 or 140 varieties breeds of animals cow cattle buffalo goat sheep and so on so many similarly for um, birds also but then you know it is only for recognition it is not a right which can convert into commercial advantage for that the whole management system of animal breeds has also for the farmers varieties we need to really think of it i used to argue long back why can't the government be the custodian of the rights of the farmers or livestock breeders why not the government work as a commercial thing so i mean there are a whole lot of issues and i would love to talk a lot on it but i don't know whether i am able to satisfy or not <laughs> a lot of uh, out of box uh, solutions perhaps we, we need to discuss yes yeah perhaps, absolutely or uh, uh, you know policy needs to be evolved on this front yes um, yes madam jatka dr kathayat asks you why remdesivir and toculi jumab are not available from industry perspective <laughs> very valid question and a very live question uh, uh, doc, uh professor atul um, uh, dr Sh yes. moria dr moria wants to say something before uh, oh I, if you allow me to leave i have another thing to do <laughs> yeah please sir uh, i think uh, that is has been your to your question no question so far uh, is coming if there is nothing else but my email is available to so you so i am open but, to it certainly sir and uh, i definitely uh, would like to thank from bottom of my heart I mean, just one call. You responded uh, positively, sir, and uh, we'll definitely would like to have you in other sessions also. My best wishes to you and regards you. to the honourable vice chancellor. Eh? Please thank come. you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Jatko, ma'am. Right. Um. So thank you for this question, and I'll just try to give you the answer that I know of from the industry. Um. You know, the demand for remdesivir injection shot up almost by five x. in last 15 days of uh, march and in april as compared to the demand that we had in january and february and this is nothing but because of the rise in covid cases positive cases now when the average monthly demand you know in january to march was on 12 lakh vials uh, average production of Uh, is likely to be about 26 lakhs vials 
and companies are now ramping up have already started you know uh, ramping up of the production of remdesivir injection as i said um, there are about seven to eight companies in india they are ramped up their production and uh, issue here is of course the demand is too high we're trying to cater as much as possible R ramping up of production is possible is happening but the production cycle of remdesivir injection is almost about one month you know you need seven days for production 14 days for sterility and stability checks and four days for packing and releasing so i think the situation should normalize in next um, one or two weeks uh, with the ramping up of production and the, this, the case with um, the other medicine that uh, professor is asking about is, um, you know, this, this is a, Dr. this Dr. is exclusive. Tocilizumab. Yes, this is this is a exclusive proprietary medicine which we are uh, importing from other country, and it is only Biocon which makes this product in India. So there is only one manufacturer. Oh. and a lot of import oh. so uh, and what has happened the alternate of uh, tocilizumab has been uh, sort of the capacity we never had these many demand of this medicine so there's only one company which is biocon biologics which uh, manufactures this and rest is all imported so probably they will also ramping up their production and uh, uh, we will soon have but that that is essentially a, a, a medicine which is now being used for treatment as well. And there are a lot of other alternatives being now found because of the non-availability of that medicine. So remdesivir, for sure, I can tell you there will be situation will be much uh, better in next two weeks. Very happy to know. I suppose in next two weeks, one minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Bias, please. Yeah. Uh, I think thanks, uh, Dr. Archana. I, I don't know whether you're a doctor or... No, I'm not a doctor. Oh, not okay. A doctor. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. But you talk very fluently in about the pharma, so I thought that you must have done something in pharmacy. <laughs> okay, good. Good to know that you are a lawyer. He's, a, yeah. he's basically a lawyer, sir. Oh. Got it, got it, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, because she's associated with IPA, Yes, yes. so yes. I would like to ask, she's telling that remdesivir uh, production is being ramped up, right? Now, in January, we knew that in February or somewhere, second wave was supposed to come. The prediction was in February, but it delayed a bit by a month or so, but it got third wave. And third wave actually became very, very large, which we never anticipated. But that could be a reason for a short-term supply issues because we don't have a very good supply chain process in place though pharma has. Then while we are ramping up, are we keeping in mind the way in oh, which this is going to go further? Because now we are seeing 3, 3.5 lakhs per day cases, which is likely to rise from 5 to 10 lakhs per day. So knowing that whether we will be having that much uh, remdesivir or not, and secondly, definitely tocilizumab Anyway, IP is doing something because you said, talked about compulsory licenses, voluntary licenses. Are we doing something where somebody is able to produce biologics and we can take up from Biocon and try to subcontract to someone to produce in large? Because it is known now, tocilizumab as well as dexamethasone together really saves mortality. Yeah, so one, your, one associated uh, question. Yeah, with this is, yeah. Uh, because I think remdesivir has uh, been developed uh, to treat Ebola, I think. Uh, so how effective uh, this medicine, this, in, you know, this the drug is for the treatment of COVID-19? <laughs> That's a great question. A question basically for the doctors. Uh, I, can, I, I can answer you to, to a certain extent, but let us answer my, my question. Yes. Yeah, so, so to, to answer your question, sir, dexamethasone is something which is we have plenty yeah, uh, in place because it is uh, made by several Indian companies. Yeah. So we've been uh, sort of working with WHO from last year. A couple of months, uh, you know, because we were trying to see what other treatment protocols would be 
you know, other than remdesivir or favipivir would be available. So dexamethasone is one such uh, option that we've been, and we have plenty of quantity of that since they, it is made in India by several companies. So that's one thing. Um, remdesivir, of course, uh, what you say is correct. I mean, this has been ongoing, but uh, there has never been a, this higher demand although it was an anticipated one we didn't know what happens is you know companies have to actually uh, be allowed to increase these capacities uh, from the government and the regulator side so they cannot the companies cannot ramp up on their own there are several regulatory and procedural uh, challenges that one has to go through uh, as a company so uh, of course uh, i think uh, now that it has happened uh, it has happened uh, and companies have ramped it up, keeping in view the numbers that you are talking of, you know, because uh, we expect a huge number and different peaks in different cities, you know, in different states uh, for this pandemic and so the remdesivir thing. Uh, so, of course, the current ramping up is, keep, uh, is done keeping in view the entire scenario, not just for India, but some of the companies are actually also exporting, although it's been restricted at this point in time by the government of India. So that is in place. Uh, to uh, answer your question, Amitji, I mean, I've been from pharma sector, I'm no expert, but I've been following up uh, with several you know, presentations by the doctors and the experts they all the all that i understand is that remdesivir alone is not a solution i think it is given in a combination with a couple of other uh, medicines and what it does is basically sort of regulates the enzymes that are produced in the body uh, which are conducive for the coronavirus to grow they actually curb this activity is as per what i understand but Having said that, um, remdesivir is alone not in the treatment protocol, although it's been widely mm -hmm. prescribed drug, uh, but that's, that's a debate, you know, probably the clinical experts or the doctors would be able to... All right, to... that was a science question from policy yeah. person, actually. Yes, yeah, sir, I'm no expert to <laughs> so comment on that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's with my limited uh, knowledge, I can tell you there is a lot of activity in that space also and people are consistently you know trying to find out uh, solutions if remdesivir is okay or dexamethasone will help or what will happen so that's, like that that's so how ipa thing. is actually how ipa is helping out to really bring about those restrictions to be a bit fav favoring towards the farmer to develop this remdesivir uh, I didn't get your question. No, no. You said that definitely remdesivir, they cannot ramp up their production because of regulatory issues. Very well understood because definitely there are issues associated with them. But there, there, I think IPA can play a very big role. Are they able to bring up both the partners on the same table and try to help out? Yes, yes, that has happened. That has happened. I mean, this was previous, uh, you know, if you were asking me a question two uh, months back, why didn't we do what we should have done? Uh, so it's, it, that's where the challenge is. But now it has already happened. I mean, that's, that's already in place. And yeah, so there's no challenge. Uh, Arshita, uh, speaking from um, global public policy perspective, uh, do you think any time, uh, you know, this DOA declaration has been invoked in the, uh, you know, TRIPS uh, Council debates, especially on the waiver, especially the recent waiver when it was discussed? Because I think uh, this is the most appropriate time, time when DOA declaration should have been invoked. Uh, you know, we are in an emergency situation. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. We can hear you. Are you able to hear us? Yeah, I uh, think she could not hear. I think uh, what I asked. Did you? Some freezing problem. I think uh, some network issue at her end. Can you hear, uh, Dr. Jatkar? I think we can switch off the video probably. Then she can she'll be able to hear us. Okay. Okay. 
can you hear um, now uh, archana yes i can i can hear you okay okay i i asked about uh, uh, you know global if speaking from global uh, ipr perspective has there been any time when uh, the doha declaration has been invoked in this public policy discourse which happened recently regarding weber and the trips council because i think you know the most appropriate time is this uh, we are facing a global pandemic and global emergency uh, especially with regard to availability of uh, drugs and medicines is concerned yeah so what is happening is you know uh, south africa and india they are arguing that doha declaration itself in itself is not enough they want to go beyond all these Uh, declarations and they're saying there has to be complete waiver of ip provisions for the period of the pandemic you know and mm-hmm. there shouldn't be any sorts of restriction mm-hmm. what happens in doha declaration you you still you know it basically has allowed issue of compulsory license you know uh, so that you are able to supply to countries which do not have a manufacturing capacity right but in this situation it will not suffice because if we are talking of vaccines you know we still are talking of compulsory license we still talking of delays here and compulsory license in several countries have a different requirements so for example you have to have 6 months elapsed before you actually issue a compulsory license you know so there are provisions within our legislations and in different countries different legislations so that's not enough and so it, the hub declaration will only give you access to that compulsory license which mm-hmm. is not enough where what these countries are saying that let's go beyond all these requirements you know because time is the essence and we cannot sort of lose forget about 6 8 months we cannot lose one day right definitely people, people are dying Mm. so they want a complete waiver there is one pertinent question again coming from uh, dr kathet if uh, the rt pcr i think he's he's type cpr test is positive then uh, can we take the med the vaccine at the same time or after uh, getting the infection no, think, in the body of anyone uh, dr i think dr kathet if you could ask your question no no i think it's not a question asked by dr kathet it has asked by someone and kathet uh, has already answered it okay 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 then i think but the, but there is a question asked by kathet there is one, yeah. there is one yeah, question ahead, is it is it worth patenting products in bangladesh uh, how can this be utilized by indian pharma oh so 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 you know the first thing you need to know about bangladesh it's a least developed country uh, within the wto definitions you know it is still Uh, they are um, in the process of ex- exceeding to become a developing country, but that negotiations are still on. So it's the least developed country, and uh, we do not know if they have a, you know, these least developed countries actually do not have strong IT systems. And to to talk about Bangladesh. uh it's it's really a small country there are several indian companies already present in bangladesh um who are um, operating out of bangladesh but since patents are territorial right you know you cannot have like patent in bangladesh and still get it in india it's not yes. something it doesn't operate so it's a fundamentally it's a territorial right exactly and uh, you have to you have to have apply it in different jurisdictions so uh, i don't think that's a feasible solution in fact uh, more on it i'll talk to you dr kathet later <laughs> yeah thank you so much i think uh, if there are no questions uh, from anyone i think we can wrap up this session it has been very uh, informative and eloquent session both the speakers uh, were very thorough in their exposition uh and i think uh, we are already ahead of our schedule around 14 15 minutes so i think uh, let us wrap up this session with a heartfelt thanks to uh, ms archana jatka and uh, dr shashank maurya for their disposition and i would like to uh, especially thank dr jyoti kaul for being present in both this session right from the beginning uh, thanks dr archana thank you so thank much thank you so much thanks yeah. to them thank you yeah yeah, yeah.
you are called as archana jatkar or jatkar it is jatkar yes i am a maharashtrian that's why i know it <laughs> right so i so that belongs so, to maharashtra <laughs> yeah right right so it is yeah. jat it is jatkar jat all right yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, feel free to reach out to me if it any. Sure. 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 Thank, sure. You, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you can you be able to share your presentation? Yes, I can. I will. Yeah, please, All right. I will supply. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Over to Dr. Kathet for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Michi. Thank you, uh, speaker of session one. Now uh, the session two uh, has a two speaker. with us and they are basically uh, talking about this uh, ip uh, act different acts in context of plant varieties and how we can use a uh, ip for a business development and all so i would like to present a brief profile of the speaker of the session 2 the first speaker dr jyoti kaul she is uh, currently working as a principal scientist in plant breeding in the, in the indian agriculture research institute pusa new delhi her research area is majorly on maize genetic resources for crop improvement she is a trained molecular cytogenetist uh, with a distinction uh, honor uh, from punjab agriculture university and her specialization was in gene location through cytological and cytogenetics approach in pearl millet she has the vast vast experience of teaching and research and she handled the diverse group of crops like cereal legumes oil seed and taught more than 10 courses uh, from bsc agriculture to veterinary sciences from master to phd student and guided more than 25 student for uh, different uh, training programs conducted by the icr conducted in her own capacity and she handled more than 15 project of uh, international and international collaborators and currently she has the project of the prestigious uh, organization is a bill and linda gates foundation she uh, represent the country in various forum in india in abroad and publish a uh, high quality research paper uh, in international and inter international uh, and, and national reputed journal like frontiers medica igg and pbj igs she uh, uh, known as a plant breeder which and she developed a uh, more than 15 variety of hybrid maize uh for a uh, different uh, uh types of cultivation and different types of nutrients uh, varieties and she developed an array of breed lines uh, lines and among those 23 have been registered as unique gem plants at icar national bureau of plant genetic resource facility new delhi for her excellent work in research uh, especially in the field of plant genetics she has been awarded as young scientist and best post presentation in uh, isca kolkata she is a gold medalist from uh, society of Bi biosciences ms randa medal from pau ludhiana askel love award from society of cytologists and genetics best nodal officer from uh, ppv and fr authority and best project uh, poster presentation from uh, from cim yt mexico and today she will talk about this plant protection variety and farmer act of 2001 in, uh, of the india and uh, from behalf of the organizing committee i welcome you ma'am for uh, and uh, for your uh, valuable presentation and thoughts on the plant protection variety and farmer act in india the other speaker of the session is dr shantanu de he is currently a vice president business development head global portfolio and in licensing msn laboratories he is a phd from uh, delhi university in organic chemistry and he is also llb uh from delhi university he has he has a combination of uh, science as well as law both his expertise in business development global portfolio formulation and api business legal uh, analytics handling in ip matters related to product grids of multiple markets uh, ip matters related to doses forms and uh, and api handling ip based negotiation and settlements evaluation for licensing of patents ip perspective business development bd project p2p in licensing out licensing uh, work he as uh, he uh, after completion of his phd he started as a group leader in chemical research from randexi and where he worked as associate director to associate director head of it in india later on he joined as sun pharma as associate vice president head ip and uh, currently he is working as a vice president msn laboratories and today he will talk about the understanding and leveraging ip for business so with this uh 
I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jyoti Paul for her uh, presentation uh, for the session. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ratul. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it all right? Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Your presentation is visible and then we can... Uh, okay. At the outset, I would like to say thanks to all of you, sir, for uh, inviting me and uh, asking me to uh, share my experiences with you. It's my proud privilege to be here. And uh, today, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I shall be discussing and sharing my experience on IPRs in agriculture especially registration of Indian crop varieties under sui generis system. Uh, well, uh, my focus will be on uh, PVPs uh, and uh, I can uh, say that uh, if we look at Indian scenario, we know very well uh, that India is basically an agrarian society and we have more of marginal farmers, farmers who have land less than one hectare. But uh, agriculture accounts for 26% of our GDP and agriculture R&D actually, uh, we have less than 1% uh, share of uh, GDP uh, into 1920. It was uh, around uh, 6,000 crores and uh, uh, look at the food grain production of the country. It has uh, grown to under 300 metric million tons in 1920, the same year. And uh, the major emphasis, of course, has been on varietal development. Uh, and every year, on an average, 300 to 500 varieties across the crop species and fisheries have been developed. Uh, we will understand that when we look at uh, the kind of varieties uh, we have, hybrids we have, we have various kinds of hybrids, single cross hybrids, double and multiple cross hybrids, we have open pollinated varieties in case of uh, cross pollinated species, and uh, we have composites, synthetics, we, uh, the point is that we have multitudes of varieties, we have all kinds of gene flow in nature, we have all kinds of genetics going on. and. Uh, in terms of maize, that's my forte. Let me share with you some uh, basic information before I proceed to PVP uh, in India. It's uh, actually a proud moment for me to inform the house that maize is the oldest breeding program of our country. Indian Council of Agriculture Research started this coordinated program way back in 1957. This is a coordinated research and this project is still going on. And uh, this project has uh, given uh, hundreds of varieties, hybrids. It has given trainings to scientists. It has generated manpower, adequately skilled. And maize as a crop is America's number one crop. It is also important in Indian context because it has nutritional aspects, quality protein maize. If you remember Norman Bolog, you know he was awarded the Peace Prize and he was actually working on quality protein maize. That is a nutritional part of maize. Specialty corns, sweet corn, who can forget sweet corn, popcorns, baby corns you have. So maize, the stakes are very high. We have all kinds of varieties coming and, uh, and uh, to top it, we have the industrial applications of maize. Thousands and thousands of products are being made of maize. You know, maize starch industry is growing like anything. And we have biofuel concept also. So uh, in such a scenario, this patent presents a competitive advantage to the organization. So these are fiercely guarded and protected. Uh, obviously, you know how it improves the resource base. I won't go into the details. I'll come straight to PVP. Uh, my task has been made easier a little bit, so some terms have already been introduced. So I will not go into the legal aspects. I'll give you the science. Uh, I'll give you a scientist version of it. Anyway, uh, the agreement on trade-related aspects of IPRs of uh, World Trade Organization 
it imposed an obligation on all member countries to go for register uh, protecting varieties either by patents or by a sui generis system or combination of both and uh, this slide actually if you look at it this is simply to mention that our system is actually based on upo so i can skip it and i'll come straight to the article 27.3b of trips agreement which says that we have to do either sui generis system we have to follow or we have to develop patents and what we did was we responded because of our compulsions because of our uh, uh, whatever scenario we have as we discussed that we have marginal farmers we have agriculture as a mainstay but we are also a growing economy we have, we are we were we have been among the fastest growing economies uh, and to we are putting these things together and we have come up with the law protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act in 2001 this is under sui generis system now the question comes what is a sui generis system for the sake of uh, the audience uh, i have put some uh, terms here just to make it clear sui generis system is a system of its own kind that is unique kind self generating kind it's not a copy kind uh, system that we have copied from the west but it is a system that has come out of our own conditions our own scenario we have taken stock of what is actually our country and because of the compulsions because of our nature because of our temperament because of everything we have developed our own system that is a sui generis system and this act is actually a sui generis system and it's an effective system for the protection of plant varieties the rights of the farmers that is very important that why it is unique friends is because it caters to the rights of the farmers not the privileges as in the west they have the privileges farmers have some privileges but here the farmers are bestowed with the rights rights can you can go and you can have that courts version on that rights they are empowered and plant breeders rights so the law treats farmers and plant breeders alike that's the best that's the beauty of this system and thirdly to encourage the development of new varieties of plants it's not to stop the breeding part it's to promote the breeding part with full flow this is in line with article 27.3b of the trips so the key aims are three in nature this is the protection of the rights of the farmers for their contribution that they make in conserving improving and making available plant genetic resources for the development of new plant varieties actually since farmers have been considered as scientists they are also breeders they have developed their own varieties which are known locally as uh, farmers varieties traditional varieties they have uh, they have been given to the farmers from generations and they people know them uh, that this is a variety which is actually native of place a this is a variety which is native of place b so the law has seen that such interests are protected number 2 protection of plant breeding breeders rights yes when the breeders are there they are working hard day and night for the development of variety they are also bestowed with the rights and third is that it satisfies the provisions of trips so in one go we have something that has uh, satisfied the interests and uh, here here now uh, what is a variety uh, variety i will not go into the details but any group of individuals which have uh, which have the same characteristics and th these remain unchanged after repeated propagation that is a variety and i just uh, because these are very famous uh, shaktiman variety is a very famous kalyan sona in wheat variety is very famous so this is a variety and law recognizes this that it should remain unchanged the characteristics should not change that is a variety and the range of varieties actually sections 14 23 29 it says we have the concept of new varieties extent varieties and farmers variety for the sake of interest actually i have put the fourth uh, essentially derived varieties now uh, edv sorry for the spelling mistake but it is a variety edvs actually uh, extent variety when you look at the extent variety these are the varieties which have been notified under seeds act see we have a very well established system in india where uh, any variety developed by any organization whether public or private it is given to the ministry 
information is given to the ministry and this is notified under seeds act so uh, all these varieties which have been notified come under extant category then we have farmers varieties as i mentioned the farmers have been doing agriculture since millennia and uh, they have developed their own varieties so these varieties are also identified and third is the group varieties about which there is common knowledge vcks these these are not notified but you know what was actually happening before 2000 was that varieties were being developed and these were propagated and these were given to farmers and they were using it so such varieties they are ruling varieties in some areas these varieties which were not notified but yet people knew about these these are varieties of common knowledge so these have also been recognized by the system by the law and any other variety which is in the public domain that can be covered so as i mentioned this is just a repeat farmers variety is maybe the variety that has been developed by the farmers themselves or hand uh, handed over to them by their ancestors this is a land race or this is a complex of of different uh, groups these are primitive varieties it could be anything but these are the varieties nevertheless on the farmers fields or even the wild relative of the species if they are growing it it comes under farmers variety edvs edvs uh, actually we have lot of interest in edvs as uh, you know edvs are uh, actually law recognizes edv and uh, these uh, here i would like to mention that edvs are actually derived from the initial variety so any two variety which you can distinguish by only a few characteristics uh, one or two characteristics that become the nidv from the initial variety that has been developed it is actually in the law and actually i wanted to have some more information on edvs our uh, experience i guys experience but because of pandemic i couldn't uh, actually go to my delhi is under lockdown so i just managed to have this uh, to make it clear let see uh, uh, this column this is the initial variety so these edvs have been developed and the traits improved have been amino acids or even pro vitamin a or sugary and shrunken so these these are the edvs the, this is protected by law this has also been given the protection by the law so that is actually the beauty of the system so new variety that is a uh, new variety uh, now we come to new variety new variety is any variety which has not been commercially exploited at the time of filing of its application what it means that today if i develop a variety it has been tested it has been released but it has not gone to the farmers field so it means it's a new variety because no one knows about it of course except the scientific community it is not seen the farmers field so the, this becomes a new variety and once i get it notified uh, within one year i can file it still i can file it uh, under new category but after one year i cannot do that i have to file it under extant category because that is a time limit that is a rider in it we can file this new variety only within one year first year of notification and there is one more thing that is very important is dust testing uh, at official dust test sites as per notified procedure which has been notified uh, by the task force and uh, as per the guidelines which we cannot change i will be taking this part in details later so novelty criterion is important for new variety uh, a new variety is considered to be novel considered to be unique considered to be having new characteristics if it is not sold in india earlier than one year of notification i told you outside india in the case of trees and vines earlier than 6 years that's the time limit or in any other case earlier than 4 years before the date of filing of such applications denomination now this uh, this protection is granted to the name you know denomination is just a name you have a variety any variety can have many names but the name with which it is filed for protection that stays as denomination so any hyphen any colon any semicolon whatever that may be that becomes a part of denomination it's just a name of the variety once registration is done it's actually given to the denomination of the variety we come to the most important part of uh, the act 
it recognizes essential characteristics it means these are the heritable uh, characteristics controlled by one or more genes so these are genetic in nature and these are oligogenic as a geneticist these are controlled by a few genes so that very minimal uh, environmental influence is there so that these remains uh, these remain unchanged most of the time and uh, and uh, in case of maize uh, i'm sharing with you that we have 31 descriptors which have been studied which have been evaluated which uh, for every variety uh, as per the guidelines and and these have to be recorded at appropriate crop stages farmers rights now what constitute farmers rights in a nutshell i can say that farmers can continue doing agric agriculture in the way they were doing before the act came into being very simple except that they cannot sell the branded seed that's all in a nutshell i'm giving you they can do all the activities they can save they can use they can sow they can re-sow exchange share and sell the farm produce except that they cannot sell as branded seed because that will be impingement of certain rights and uh, that is actually forbidden and the best thing is those farmers who are actually engaged in conservation and preservation of genetic resources of or land races and wild relatives of crop plants uh, they are doing their implement in their own way and they're preserving they are actually um, sup uh, supplementing uh, they are awarded they are given genome savior awards every year uh, before this pandemic actually every year uh, very big events uh, are organized uh, where uh, the progressive farmers even the traditional farmers the marginal farmers all those farmers who are identified they are they are given the certificates of honor they are given uh, the cash award also uh, they are recognized by the system so it encourages them these are the farmers rights now similarly as i said uh, breeders uh, rights are also there so uh, they uh, they can uh, go for production selling marketing distribution export import everything and uh, the only thing is that we cannot have the material from the farmers without authorization that is the beauty if we want to take the material from the farmers and say okay i want to develop a variety this variety has some uh, deficiency i want to overcome it it's fine you can do it but we need to get their consent and consent doesn't mean verbal consent it means on documentary evidence has to be there researchers rights you know the the beauty of this system is researchers rights those of us who are not breeders but they would like to have access to germ plasm access to have registered material even they are not barred from taking this material and uh, doing research for research purpose it's open to all and uh, it's open to all for research purpose the only thing is if you develop uh, if you use it at the end of the day for some commercial activity you have to share the benefits with the original inventors and uh, one thing here uh, that is very important is that if uh, the researcher has taken an inbred line which happens to be the parental line and if they are using it for repeated propagation for developing a material then the original breeder has to be put in the loop and uh, there has to be documentary evidence the the only thing is please keep the papers in uh, proper order and do research ethically that is actually what the essence of this act and uh, compulsory licensing you know my job has been made very easy the previous speaker very well elaborated on compulsory licensing even in agriculture this uh, uh, this public interest uh, is uh, stream and this has uh, precedence over the commercial breeders yes any uh, organization if it's putting the seed at exor exorbitant price then the authority has uh, the right to cancel the license and give it to the third party without the consent of the original inventors they can do it uh, in public interest if this is there very much there and protection against bad seed farmers are protected against bad seed if they report that they have got bad seed it law will take its course 
in principle, he is protected against the bad seed. No organization can supply bad seed. Quality of seed is very important. And uh, one more thing uh, is protection against innocent infringement. You know, our farmers, as I said, most of them are marginal farmers. They are, they, uh, they are educated, they are aware, but they may not be uh, very well aware about this law. So uh, by innocence, they uh, may be kind of trespassing. So law is uh, not stringent. For, uh, first time it happens, it will be taken okay. No problem. Now learn about the law, but don't repeat it. So uh, there is a, uh, protection against innocent in infringement. The farmers won't be taken to task, won't be jailed uh, if it has happened uh, inadvertently, but deliberately uh, it cannot happen. And uh, it has to be proven in the court that it was, uh, it just happened innocently. So uh, after this, you know, once uh, we understand the law, we need to submit an application. I will not go into the details. Anybody can do. And uh, this is uh, where um, my role came because as a part of this public organization, I was given the task of filing this application on behalf of the breeders. This is what we did. And uh, this is the application form. Uh, all these are the um, uh, uh, information is available at the authorities uh, website. This is important what the applicants have to declare. Number one, uh, they have to declare that it is term free of terminator technology. GERD technology is not there. This is a number one affidavit that has to be signed and not notarized. And then uh, that uh, the material is lawfully, legally acquired. They have to give in writing that it has chori ka mal nahi hai. It has been legally acquired. It has come to them from their seniors or they have generated it through the cross. For that, they need to have the complete passport data. Complete passport data, how you started the experiment, who were the persons who did it, where was it done, everything that is given in this part. And then uh, also we have to mention that uh, whether any uh, tribal or rural families were involved, the material has come from any farmers or anything. We, as per section 41, we have to declare it. Now, in case of farmers variety, even they, we have to declare certain things there. The, as I said, uh, GERD technology uh, is forbidden. So we have to get this affidavit. Others are that uh, farmers varieties, the passport data, everything is same as in the previous case. So what what is the seed requirement like for registration? See, uh, we need to have, for new hybrids and OPBs, we need to have three kgs and uh, for extend notified, we have a farmer's variety, we have 600 grams. As we will uh, see later, why we have different uh, quantities of seed required for various categories of the crops, crop varieties. But most important is the seed quality report, where moisture is eight to 10%, physical purity, 98% uh, minimum is required, germination, why? seed viability for single cross hybrids are in 80% varieties and double cross hybrids 90% minimum. This is because uh, then only genetic purity can be maintained and test can be conducted. And this report has to be recent one. This is the process of registration. Uh, this is how uh, applications submitted. They are scrutinized and accepted after scrutiny and then uh, it's published. And after that, three months time is the uh, period given. If anyone wants to oppose, they have the proof, they can oppose it. Otherwise it will be proceeded for registration. Then there is a committee which sits for EVRC extent committee. But then, as I said, uh, for new applications, uh, some tests are also recommended. The same committee recommends tests. And dust testing, as I said, uh, dust testing is the uh, integral component of the act. This dust testing or DUS testing is uh, DUS distinctivity, uniformity, and stability. Dr. Moria also referred to DUS. Uh, so distinct, the variety which we have filed for registration should have at least one essential characteristic by virtue of it, it can be discriminated from the rest of the varieties. It should have one unique character. Second is uniformity. It should be uniform. It should not be variable. It should not be heterogeneous. 
and we will see what uniformity I have uh, uh, in other slides. I'm presenting some data. Stability. It should be stable, means the characteristic should be propagated stably. It should be in the population. It should not change. Excuse me. After each cycle of propagation. And uh, this is important. Uh, DOS test is actually not conducted randomly at anywhere. The sites are notified in the gazette. It's identified uh, by the task force. Uh, different crops, all the crops have their sites in, throughout India. And uh, the, uh, there are actually two sites for new variety, two for uh, all the categories, in fact, new VCKs and farmers variety, except that the uh, testing is done for two years in case of new variety and one year need for VCKs and farmers variety. The guidelines. Testing guidelines are uh, actually uh, recommended, not only recommended, but they have to be implemented and it is monitored. Every year, the monitoring team will come and visit and take the, with the help of inch tape uh, record, whether, whether really we have gone for 75 centimeters or is there any change, uh, anybody can raise uh, any issue. This, that kind of thing was there, but now uh, things have relaxed a little bit, uh, but uh, the guidelines have to be followed. This is, uh, I'm giving you about uh, just uh, the glimpse of maize uh, scenario. We have the nodal of, uh, center and we have the sub centers. Sorry for that. Uh, then there are additional centers also, uh, need-based centers. In case of maize, we have the dust descriptors in maize. Uh, these are 31 uh, descriptors are there, out of which nine are the star traits. And uh, these 31 traits, if you, these are actually based on eyeballing and recording some traits. Eyeballing is uh, where we have the visual assessment. Uh, we can take the visual assessment of uh, parts of the plants or the groups of the plants. We can measure the groups of the plants or parts of the plant. We have different categories. And uh, these are the star traits. Uh, we have anthesis, time of anthesis, tassel angle, tassel attitude, ear, uh, silk, pigmentation, plant length, ear length without husk, ear type of grain, ear color of top of grain, ear anthocyanin coloration of blooms of cough. These are very important traits. Grouping traits, these are five in nature and these are actually for, uh, used for grouping the varieties, uh, for coming out with the groups of varieties, like time of anthesis and time of silk emergence. Uh, so it means uh, whether the variety is early, medium or late in maturity. Then silk pigmentation also happens to be there. We can categorize them. We can segregate the varieties based on these traits, plant length and type of the grain. And all these traits have to be recorded at specific stages. We cannot, uh, we, we have to uh, consider these stages. Here it's, it's given here are the time of flowering or uh, this maturity. Then uh, this, just a glimpse of the traits. If you see uh, these, these are the tassel traits as I showed. So here, we must know what is the tassel length, that is the shape, density, see the pigmentation and uh, the, the base of the gloom, all these traits matter. Leaf traits also, if you look at this, this is one, this is leaf angle and leaf is direct. We have this leaf angle, but leaf is droopy and we have this without pigmentation, we have pigmented the leaf dia and erect and this, we have all these things to consider here. Uh, then we have silk pigmentation. We have the, uh, we have anthocyanin coloration types of grain, as I mentioned. Here the kernel traits, here the ears, straight, spiral. If you see the spirally present, then irregular. We have white, yellow with white. We have orange, even the red cops are there. Then this is the opaque seed. These are white tinted seeds. These are the shrunken seeds of sweet corn. These are popcorn seeds. Everything is actually considered part of the guideline. Here, just mentioned that categories we have. Uh, we have anthesis and silk emergence. We have very early, early, medium and late. Very early, early, medium and late. 
flowering attributes are actually location, location specific. Uh, even then, these are very important traits. Plant length, we have different categories. Plant ear placement, see, uh, some varieties or some hybrids can have very high ear placement. Some have medium ear placement. These are also part of the guidelines. This is the length and diameter that will give an idea what kind of work individually we have to do. Shape. We have to mark the shapes as cylindrical, conical and conical cylindrical. Then even kernel shapes. We have to record kernel shapes as per the guideline. We have to see individually. And then kern, uh, ear number of kernels per row. And then kernel, 1000 kernel weight. That is also part of the guidelines. This is silk pigmentation. See, we have something like this, something like this. We have to categorize here. It guideline says absent. It says present. So now, once we have the trial, we have references. Very important references uh, because uh, we have to compare the candidate varieties with references. We cannot uh, just compare them with each other, but then we need to have certain existing varieties which we use as reference. All the registered hybrids, all the parental lines and OPBs constitute the reference collection. So genetically pure seeds we need to have and uh, we have the centers providing us with the references. So references are an integral component of the trials. Here, I, as I was uh, mentioning, look at the quality of the trial, a pre-flowering stage, you know, every plant should be visible. There has to be uh, really uh, meticulously done. In a, this is a field condition, then emergence of tassel, if you see, it is happening here. The silk emergence has happened. This is the reference. If you see really, you can find that uh, these are different. Some individuals are like this, some are like that. It should, sometimes it appears like the way it is here. And here, the trial. This is a hybrid trial. Hybrids are very tall, but inbred parental lines are very short and tassels are different. This is how the trial appears during maturity when uh, the ears are harvested. Here also, see the hybrid ear and the inbred ear. Th these are the parental lines, but these are the hybrids, which are actually commercially exploited. These are the parental lines only used for the development of the hybrid. And here, this is very interesting part that sometimes, you know, we, when varieties come to us for uh, testing, uh, as I said, grouping of varieties, this is where actually grouping comes. See, this is a early variety which has matured. When we see all around the varieties, all these varieties are still green. So this is an early variety. It can also happen. So for it, we have to record uh, traits separately for every variety. They have the requirements are met. This is uh, inbred and maturity. And as I said, uh, genetic purity is very important if we have want to have the right expression of the descriptors. So this is uh, this will uh, give you an idea the kind of seed production programs we need to take up. Uh, these are the females. These are the males. Male are the pollinators. You know very well. Hybrid in maize we have the concept of male and female lines. Male lines uh, both are the inbred lines though, and uh, but the seed parent female is a detasseled one so it is a seed parent and the male is a pollinator which is tassel is there which is detasseled so so what, when we harvest the seeds from the female line these are the hybrid seeds these are actually given for testing with that actually dust testing part is over and uh, once we compile the data it is the job of the authority PPBFR authority to compile the data and come up with the distinctiveness of the variety and register or reject the variety accept or reject that is their forte our job is actually to uh, compile the data for two locations for two years or one uh, year for two locations whatever the data we have from different centers we compile and we pass it on to the authority that is uh, one thing uh, uh, if you remember dr uh, moria also mentioned about uh, germplasm registration so i think uh, this is an appropriate time for me to discuss this part of registration also this is a soft protection as we will see Crop genetic resources, you know, uh, this is a measure to conserve crop genetic resources, which are very important. I don't need to go into details for that. Now, what kind of uh, resources are these? These are old and obsolete varieties in any crop. Varieties which are not in seed production chain, 
any experimental hybrid or varieties or released hybrids or pools and populations, even mapping populations and segregating generations, F1, F2, F3 are inbred lines. These are the crop genetic resources. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I should give uh, some genesis of this program. In 2001, we had the egg, uh, and uh, in 2004, we started this program. Actually, the feeling was that uh, since breeders are uh, working very hard, they are developing varieties, but not all varieties are notified, and not all notified varieties reach to the farmers. Some varieties don't uh, see the daylight. They are not recommended. They are um, de-promoted. Then some in, we develop inbred lines. Hundreds and thousands of inbred lines are developed. So it, uh, if there is no system to conserve it, it it's a, such a wastage. And breeders also lose heart. If they see that their material is not uh, released as variety, then what happens to this material? So the system is in place at NBPGR, ICR and NBPGR, where such promising material can be has been recognized, OK? They, have, uh, they can be filed for soft protection. It means uh, this is registered for 15 years. The breeder, this is one way to honor the breeder for his or her hard work. So the kind of material we can have uh, potential inbred lines or uh, genetic stocks even for donors uh, for tolerance or resistance, biotic and abiotic resistances, hydrotic pools, populations, land races for the traits other than what it is known for an exotic germplasm for the trade other than what it has been imported for. These can also be registered at NBPGR. The eligibility criteria, again, this is the part of application, so I, I won't be giving the details. I'll skip this. This, uh, this is uh, application format is there. Well-established system is there. This is the form. We have to fill it up. And the thing is that we need to have DUS profile of our material. We have to put it there. We have to have the co good quality photographs of the diagnostic traits. We have to have the information on the breeding method that has been used. Checklist we have to present. Then we have the most important is the performance data. We have to compile the performance data of the material that we are proposing for registration at NBPGR. Uh, it is not for the yield. Yield is only for release of the variety. But here, besides yield, the disease resistance or resistance to abiotic stresses or any other nutritional traits, all these are actually considered for registration. And uh, here, some requirements are there, but uh, if uh, the variety meets that, it can be registered. This is just the indicative uh, where in maize I have put it. Uh, contributing yield, uh, contributing traits like ear length without sheath, ear girt, tip filling, adaptation traits, and disease resistance, resistance to maize leaf fly, tersicum leaf fly, post flowering stalk fly, including nutritional traits like micronutrients, uh, iron and zinc, uh, lysine, amino acids like lysine, tryptophan, methionine, even protein, oil, starch can be considered. And we need to have documentary evidence of that material. That is, it, it has to be published. This is where actually publishing comes into uh, very, it is uh, really encouraged that you publish your data and then you come for registration. This is the passport data. Actually, I'm using the word passport data and you, you may be wondering what kind of data we have to put here. This is actually important for the allocation of the indigenous collection. IC number. Every material that goes uh, to NBPGR is given IC number. This IC number is uh, uh, important for accessioning and conservation of germplasm. This is the passport data. Uh, here we write uh, the names, the groups, and all. Here we put uh, the traits that this is early flint yellow. This is the source germplasm that has been given. This is the category. This is the inbred line. Everything like this, we develop this passport data. This is important for uh, before we go for dust testing, this is also important in that. This is important for NBPGR registration also. So seed quantity here also, we need to have seed quantity. It is 500 to 1000 kernels, 85% uh, seed viability. The PGRC is there. It considers and decides that's final. And this type of registration is also given for 15 years. And uh, 15, it's published and uh, it is brought to the notice of the public that this material is given registration for 15 years. Uh, it can be used through proper channel. Anybody, uh, it, 
uh, if they want to use this material it is open to them it's not debarred from using it is available anybody can put an application and they can use this material uh, so uh, deregistration is also there if anything comes that okay this material was actually falsely claimed so deregistration can also happen and uh, i think uh, we have talked about germplasm exchange uh, this germplasm exchange uh, is really crucial to breeding programs of any kind anywhere developing countries and developed countries everywhere but uh, we have to uh, guard our germplasm also we we cannot deny that we have our system in place and uh, but we have to share our germplasm also for that now exchange of germplasm is actually dependent upon the documents as i said we have to keep our documents for any uh, scrutiny any any time anybody can ask so we need to have certain documents when we get our material from any one in even in the country we need to go for material transfer agreement this is a document available and if you want to procure the material from abroad uh, we have standard material transfer agreement and uh, one uh, thing uh, that i want to in inform the house is uh, sometimes you know what is happening is then uh, we don't feel like signing you know okay ab kya sign karenge then we becomes responsibility so the it is very clear whether we sign or not still uh, this uh, Uh, cop this responsibility will rest on us we have three modes signature option shrink wrap and click wrap click wrap is online no issues we have to click it and then get it shrink wrap is when we when we may not sign the actual document but we when we get the seed when when we tear the packet tearing of pa packet implies that we have accepted the terms and conditions so again it becomes our responsibility to maintain it and i think uh, i've come to the last part and i uh, wind up thanks if if there are any questions thank you so much ma'am for a nice and elaborate presentation and explaining this uh, plant protection variety act in detail so uh there are few comments to uh, given by the professor asha and is regarding this uh, praising these uh, indian breeders and farmers and scientists basically and she has the uh, one question that uh, india has the largest variety and uh, an abundance of millets extremely nutritious grown all around suited to varied environment and habitats why are these are not promoted it's only this recently the uh, the koda it's a one of the kind of pal uh, some millet or ragi uh, which is uh, grown in uttarakhand uh, region so it came into news after japanese took an interest in it why it's uh, uh, the, i think the question is that why we are not talking about the local and uh, local varieties are not very much popular which are just specific to some particular kind of uh, environment conditions yeah fine fine i got the question very good question and uh, in fact anybody who is actually bothered about nutritional aspects of our population they will think in terms of local varieties yes you are very correct Uh, i i koda uh, millet uh, everybody knows is a nutritional package actually all the millets coarse millets right. you know what has happened in our country after green revolution you know a green revolution put actually a bonus on wheat and rice before that all mota dana used to be the part of our daily diets but uh, with the change in dietary habits with the change uh, when all these varieties uh, new high yielding varieties came into being people should change their eating habits and move more to a finer uh, grains and now we are into the fast food culture but uh, we have seen the repercussions of it icr noticed that uh, i in fact icmr and icr collaborated on this with the project and they, they came up with the fact that okay such things are detrimental for the health of our population and uh, people are actually used to were you uh, used to eating coarse millets uh, very uh, dishes are there when nutritious dishes are available so we should do something about it and uh, this uh, crp projects came into being uh, for the last 10 years no uh, this I, as i said one phase was where the high yielding varieties came into being hybrids like i myself with maize 
we have land races you know you will wonder we have purple uh, variety of maize which is actually full of anthocyanins anti carcinogenic properties yet people are uh, very wary because why hybrids fetch money in the market uniformity they get a uh, huge uh, they, they get a uh, very good amount of money in the market they can export it hybrids are money making machines kind of so but these local varieties they are irregular small they are full of nutrition but people when we go to the market we say okay bahut bada bada chahiye bahut wo chahiye but these small, small desi varieties are actually they are laggards but right. those who have understood it they are actually promoting it uh, vanna shiva's ngos and all they are actually working towards uh, pro preservation conservation of these resources as i mentioned in the presentation also genome savior awards are given to all those farmers who are actually conserving the uh, uh, local uh, native varieties which have uh, which are otherwise not available with the commercial breeders you know so because right. of the commercial aspects actually we lost touch with nature that is actually i can go on on uh, if you right. want uh, we can uh, we have no project sure ma'am yes, uh, uh, the my, my question is that if we are uh, giving a rights to a particular variety or particular reason so in that case the commercial rights it's with the farmers or it's given to the particular reason or to the state government or maybe the uh, district of that particular area If okay i'll take okay. Right. okay as i if i got it correctly you know what is happening in our country uh, agriculture is a state subject right. but certain parts of agriculture are uh, with uh, union central okay. government okay mm -hmm. so right. what is happening is that uh, we have been filing applications on behalf of the state government okay we have been doing it because registration is a costly affair it right. cost money so all the state uh, governments they have given to us pv once means mm -hmm. they have authorized icar mm -hmm. so this uh, commercialization rests with the state uh, universities with the original breeders of all the states those who have developed the varieties but their protection management all such issues rests with icar icar is paying you some in collaboration to the state universities but once a variety is developed by the state it remains state's proprietary it is it doesn't belong to icar as such but then at the end of the day uh, as per the seed act public variety be it private variety if it is notified it is the government's asset it can be deployed as per the wishes of the government need based so did i satisfy the answer or i need to elaborate Yeah, there is come some confusion in my mind, so now I, I just clear on this point. Yeah. The original uh, breeders are honored. It belongs to them only. Mm -hmm. It cannot be taken away from them. The only thing is, ICR is doing the job on mm -hmm. behalf of the state governments. Uh, Dr. Jyoti, um, I think I, if I am correct, uh, there is a national gene bank like located in ICR. Uh, yes, so exactly. if you could tell us a little bit, oh, you know, sure. more about the national gene bank and how much. varieties are protected how 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 effective is the preservation in national gene bank about of germ plasm uh, okay uh, i'll tell you national gene bank is actually the facility that is housed in national bureau of plant genetic resources new delhi so uh, i can tell you uh, as far as maize is concerned 10000 accessions are available there you know it Uh, if you consider ten thousand for maize, you can have safely you can say twenty thousand accessions for wheat, rice, and all. It is it is full of uh, the accessions. Uh, very old accessions are also available, and new accessions are also available. I did uh, mention about the IC numbers. Yes. You know, all the accessions are given the IC number. This IC number is available at the NBPGR portal. If you uh, want to see that, okay. The exact number for different crops, I can't say. But maize, yes, one hundred percent, I can tell you. It is ten thousand stations. These have come from various parts of the country, from uh, farmers' fields. Also, it has come from USA, from European Union, from Australia, from Indonesia, from various parts of the globe through CIMIT. CIMIT organization is an international organization which is working for maize and wheat. So they have really uh, actually helped uh, in bringing material to India. and it is housed in uh, this national gene bank it is very effective sir right. if you have any material mm -hmm. 
if you think uh, you can put it uh, for conservation purpose it is not for registration let me put it it is for conservation i'll come to that other gene bank later so this uh, the gene bank which is housed in uh, nbpgr is actually for conservation purpose so that um, so that uh, in case of any eventuality at least you have one set of uh, germplasm of different crops available in viable condition they have a permafrost also in ladakh they have developed the facility so they have there so uh, if you want i can send you information exactly about this part uh, Uh, right. But uh, but one thing about a national gene bank of uh, PPVFRA, PPVFRA too has a gene bank, the national gene bank also, and wherever the registered varieties have been housed, when we give the seed to them, as I said, we give three kg seed, we give we give six hundred grams or one point five kg. You know why we are doing is actually part of the seed is put in the national gene bank. So once it is registered, it comes in registered germplasm, registered varieties. so that after 3 4 years 5 years they can bring the seed sample back to us for confirmation whether uh, the variety which is sold in the market is same as the one which has been uh, conserved in the gene bank so actually uh, this kind of work is uh, only on papers it has not been practically done but uh, since it is a very new act uh, things are happening actually and uh, i became a part of this act uh, uh, way back in 2007 so we have kind of uh, in in our bit we have developed the system of uh, registration of varieties especially in maize this is anything Ma how many farmers varieties have been registered if i think there have been certain varieties uh, i remember attending one seminar in dapur i think mm. some name i think some ram you uh, know uh, he developed some new variety so i mean yeah, if you could uh, you know focus or uh, tell us little more about farmers varieties and how much uh, that recognition has uh, helped farmers uh, you know uh, getting uh, protected their varieties see i cannot give you the names of the farmers unfortunately i don't have access to that data i but uh, i i do know that this uh, act uh, is live for farmers because many 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 farmers all over the country have been honored with the certificates they have come to delhi they have been brought from their native places to delhi and uh, one madam you referred uh, from uttarakhand uttarakhand farmers are very progressive and they have also been recognized you know actually what is happening is that in case of wheat and rice a uh, very uh, unique varieties uh, farmers varieties are there like salt tolerant rice variety is there from uh, and then we have a very important rice variety from kerala these are the local varieties which have been registered under farm farmers variety category and in uh, case of wheat and rice situation is uh, promising but in case of maize actually uh, it is a very uh, kind of uh, situation is like that it, it is highly commercial crop you know private sector is very 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 active and they are do developing uh, hybrids day in and day out in the market we only see hybrids so in case of maize these farmers varieties are very few and far between only in pockets of north east meghalaya manipur you have such uh, areas where people eat uh, uh, these uh, maize uh, farmers varieties uh, in rest of the country you know maize has become a commercial crop industrial crop rather feed crop is no longer food crop so emphasis has shifted but in case of wheat and rice yes sizable uh, farmers varieties have been uh, actually brought in and they have been tested and they have been registered at nbpgr if you want uh, my counterparts from wheat and rice can give you better idea about but i can say that here yes, that is farmers varieties have been conserved farmers have been recognized also thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am for a uh, nice and uh, very elaborate information regarding the plant protection varieties especially with the farmer rights thank you so much ma'am and now it's time to call yes, our ma'am thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you thanks for your time thanks a lot thanks. my privilege uh, and now it's time to call our next speaker of the session uh, dr shantanu dev he is currently a vice president of uh, business development and had global portfolio in in licensing in msn laboratories he is phd in organic chemistry from delhi university and also a llb from delhi university 
his expertise in business development global portfolio formulation and api business legal and analytics handling in ip matters related to product grids of multiple markets uh, ip matters ip matters related to doses forms and api handling ip based negotiation and settlements evaluation for licensing of patents ip prospective business development bd project p2p in licensing and out licensing processes uh, if i talk about his professional work journey so he started his journey from randaxi as a group leader in chemical research where he uh, promoted to associate director in ip uh, related to api and then uh, associate director head of ip india later on he joined sun pharma as associate vice president and head ip and now he is in uh, msn laboratories as a vice president today uh, dr shantanu dev they will talk about this uh, understanding and leveraging uh, ip for business uh, processes so now i request uh, dr shantanu dev to please share his presentation and views and thoughts on uh, this topic yeah uh, am i audible yes sir yeah dr shantanu welcome Yeah, thank you, Doctor Vyas. I am really grateful that you invited me in this. I think you are the only series. lawyer and a scientist together. <laughs> yes. So, so, but I was hearing the esteemed speaker uh, who sh was speaking Dr. last. It Dr. seemed Dr. to Shashank be. Dr. Shashank Maurya is also a well-be and science scientist basically. Okay, so okay. Dr. Shashank okay. Maurya, uh, you know, he is a PhD in genetics and then law also. So we have two very <laughs> important. uh personalities with us today okay thank you thank you very much uh, uh, dr vyas and uh, i mean the the rest of the uh, colleagues uh, who are participate started i mean I, i think believe from 130 onwards uh, in staggered form you have these very enriching lectures uh, from speakers who are having specialized uh, expertise in different areas uh, of say microbiology and biotechnology and science i believe and i'm sure the students and attendees had got a very uh, fruitful and effective uh, learning uh, session i would say and would have been appraised of the latest happenings in the field, in the respective fields so thank you once again so i think i will just switch on my video because i have some issue with bandwidth yes. and uh, i can, i will just share the presentation and just go through it and uh, once again thank you atul for the brief introduction yeah thank you I hope you are able to see the presentation. Uh yes sir it's starting. Okay. So started yeah. So just let me know if it's visible uh, and when I am moving the slides I will say that I am moving to the next slide that it's actually moving because uh, sometimes it happens I mean there will be a lag and I will speak and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the slide will not be there yeah. Still started screen sharing and double click to enter full screen mode. So. Okay. Yes. That's fine. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I am actually just uh, just for the benefit of the back uh, audience, I would just like to uh, you know extra uh, pull it on what uh, Atul had just. Uh, yeah, you know the way he introduced me so i have expertise in terms of chemical research and pharmaceutical sciences and a little bit of uh, you know the biotechnology and the biologics aspect of it uh, so pardon me uh, if i am not actually touching uh, seriously on those topics but please feel free to stop me if you have not understood any concept of ip i am a hardcore chemist as well as an ip guy uh, with an ip legal background so implication so uh you know industry uh, ha had been uh, in india uh, in comparison to western country that has been a very no way say i mean we are hardly i believe uh, in 2004 or 5 that the concept of ip came here in india and people started uh, reading about ip and trying to exploit and explore what it is about and how uh, it gives us Uh, uh right in terms of whether it's a tangible or intangible asset and how it can be monetized how an ip can be filed in fact how you can have an ip 
and also how to monetize the ip so that's basically we have to understand and what are the rights it gives i'm sure the audience uh, will have some idea uh, so if any slide is something which you all of you know just just uh, you know stop me and ask me to move to the next slide sure sir okay so to begin with i acknowledge my parent company and also i acknowledge dr vyas for inviting me in this uh, forum so this is a disclaimer so though the concepts are general and uh, they are well established they are vetted i would still prefer to disclaim it by saying that these are my personal views and my way of expressing and interpreting the same uh, just to make the audience understand like what the concepts are and i have been in this business for more than 20 years so i believe whatever i am saying will be somewhere somewhat true uh, feel free to criticize me so basically what are the ip concepts that uh, the yeah. audience yeah somebody is speaking uh, does he have does anybody have any question not yet yes. okay okay so understanding ip basically you will uh, be uh, you know uh, these are the areas uh, the the ones which i have indicated i mean the red red highlights oh, what are the various type of ip worldwide you will be having so one is a copyright another is a patent trademark industrial design geographical indications and trade secrets so some of them are very interesting and some of them have been a natural outflow because of the scientific output and of humans uh, so copyright patenting trademark industrial design these came and of course trade secrets these came out of you know inventions innovations and various uh, foray into scientific uh, findings whereas geographical indication is something which happened uh, because of you know nature so i will just briefly explain like a copyright is something which is more towards literary and artistic work of a uh, uh, inventor i would say and it resides uh, while he is alive that's fine but it also resides 50 years after uh, 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 inventor's death so after his death also the the right remains with him till 50 years okay, one minute the right is stuck i think on the disclaimer oh i see okay Would I share your slides? I also have your problem copy. Yeah, I, that's fine. I mean, I will. So I am right now on uh, the heading understanding IP. Okay, I'm just sharing for now. Yes, this is the slide. Yes, please. Yeah, this is the right now. Yes, yes, yes. That's fine. So uh, right. let me explain. So copyright is something which comes out, arises out of you know creativity and uh, you know artistic literature. uh paintings maybe sculpture and all those so uh, right on those suppose some uh, some uh, author writes a book so it's his copyright and it it goes 50 years beyond his death so that's where uh, you know it gives the right to its suppose the books are still being sold so this it gives rights to its estate or to to their the beneficiaries and uh, the the legal legal uh, hires uh, of that author similarly a patent now a patent is a creation of an invention and it generally worldwide uh, you know initially the life of a patent and the rights associated with a patent had varied from country to country but then these general bodies like wipo and then some global conventions all these were made and all countries were made to sign and in order to reap the benefits of an ip uh, and and to get a global right kind of thing you, you need to follow the rules which are global and of course a patent is a territorial right so if you have want to have a patent right you need to file patent in a particular country and if the uh, patent body gives the patent finally then the right resides i mean it's a territorial right it's limited to the country which the body which has given you the patent right like i file a patent in india i get the patent granted the right is only limited to indian territory and it is generally from the year of filing Uh, i mean from from a general perspective we can we can consider this that it's 20 years from a date of filing of a first application which the inventor files in case of trademark it is 10 years and these are renewables whereas in case of patent it is not renewable so some patents in in some countries is eligible for extensions you know because all innovators will put all the hard work and they will pump in money for the research and all so there is a benefit which has been given by Uh, local i mean the regional or the country wise statute uh, not all countries in the world will give but and or not all patents will be eligible so they are eligible if if at all it qualifies for that extension it will be qualified for another additional 5 years maximum and this thing goes in parallel with 
for example the patent is related to a x product and the product got approved by a regulatory agency and uh, so so the patent runs and the ap approval process of a application against a product also they both run in parallel one runs in patent office another runs in ministry of health that yeah, i mean under it the regulatory bodies the health agencies ministry of health and all that so regulatory agencies like fda and all or dcgi in india so in parallel when your application flies so if you get the patent later so there will be a cap so for example in us maximum 14 years of uh, from the date of uh, approval uh, is something that will make you eligible for a patent extension so basically i will explain it later uh, so some patents only say product patent or in some case uh, the uh, the method of use patent wherever or whichever patent uh, the uh, innovator the, it's a prerogative of innovator that he applies to the patent office and says that uh, patent office as well as to the regulatory agency that this is the patent i choose and please extend me five more years because uh, the the process of approval of my product has been slow and i should be compensated so that's the logic or theory behind such such an extension and it's not worldwide like india does not give any patent extension but us will give canada will give australia will give europe will give next is a trademark which is a tenures and it is renewable <clears throat> because business is set up on a trademark right i mean a trademark gets popular so it becomes an asset and uh, a general public will recognize a product only based out of a trademark so that's why it is a renewable then you have industrial design which is aesthetic design like a logo or something for an industry and then there is a geographical indication so famous example is darjeeling tea so uh, growers who can farmers or tea cultivators who grow the tea in and out of darjeeling region the notified area region they can label their product as darjeeling tea like i based out of say for example in delhi and if i have say a tea garden in himachal i cannot label my product as darjeeling tree so these geographical indications are geographically centered located to the pain so any drink uh, coming out of say any part of the world cannot be labeled as champagne the, this liquid this drink is only which is coming out from champagne uh, district and territory of france another is trade secret so in trade secret nothing is actually out in public in all the other like copyright patent trademark and industrial design and geographical indication the author is benefited or the farmer or the grower is benefited if he labels it if he brings out the invention he publishes it and files the document his invention so he makes it public whereas in case of trade secret you are not making anything public so still it's a right and of course it can be sold or licensed or anything but then you have to believe the person or the company which holds the trade secret like for example the formula the formula or uh, uh, you know the ingredients mixture the qualitative quantitative of say the word again the famous example is of coca cola so it's a trade secret nobody knows so it is passed down on generation to generation and only a few uh, you know close knit uh, workers and uh, uh, management maybe Mm, uh, will be knowing the secret actually so the ingredients are coded so actually nobody will know what percentage and what amount uh, and what what exactly are the qualitative ingredients which are going into making of that uh, recipe so these are called as trade secrets can we move to the next slide please so so those were the type of these uh, intellectual property which generally uh, a government uh, or an agency will provide to an individual whereas an individual has to leverage uh, those rights in what way it helps in protecting his innovative products so in return he has to disclose it but he will get some exclusive benefit for 20 years so he can nobody you know i cannot just go and copy his things and start making and and start selling in the market i have to you know go uh, abide by the pa granted patent which has been given to him and if i if, if i do something which falls in the granted claims of a patent i need to you know go back negotiate with him pay some royalties so it's beneficial so he is protecting his innovation as well as leveraging it in terms of monetary benefit and filing a patent for having a trademark and uh, uh, having something like industrial design it gives you a visibility so it, you are able to make your own sign you know your business is distinguished like a mcdonald signature or a mcdonald 
you know the the way it's written the color which is used so they all distinguish that it is different you know nobody can copy that and start making its own product and saying that it is and you know you can you just can't sell things which are not uh, licensed out from mcdonald's in the same way so and also it ha helps in accessing technical business information this is for the recipient party like if for example uh, you know pfizer files a patent on a molecule if i am able to read that patent i will be having access to that information i can then extrapolate that information i can for do some further research on that information so somebody has helped me in you know uh, hand holding and giving the information of the research which had happened in their labs so that's another benefit and of course so patent or all these uh, intellectual property i mean the rights that is given is a negative right so two things it gives actually for a product or for an invention it tells me what to do it also tells me what not to do so basically if i sell a product in a market uh, this is important uh, i need to check my product against others patent not against my patent so which means when i am selling a product in a market or i i mean this aspect when i am saying a commodity which is being sold in the market this is applicable to biologics this is applicable to any damn thing which comes under the purview of ip definition which is intellectual property so when i am selling a, pro a product in a market or when i want to launch a product it has to be cleared of everybody else's ip not my ip and when i am filing a ipa when i am filing a patent it is actually excluding others from doing what i have filed and what i have been able to get granted so this uh, let this be clear for everybody yeah can we move to the next slide so any whether it is chemistry pharmaceutical sciences biologics or uh, anything any damn thing you know a computer business method a software program so these are the elements which one has to qualify in order to get a patent so first and foremost i mean in a very general layman's way i would describe these uh, these parameters so one is novelty so just for the understanding of the group suppose uh, you are you are bringing out something and suppose it is disclosed in the entire thing is disclosed in one journal or in one publication or in one patent or somewhere else in a poster or a, anywhere it is documented in one single place then that sort of a reference literature is called as a novelty destroying prior art which mean all elements of your invention if it is already known in one single place in one single document it means you are not eligible for a patent on uh, on your own so it's already disclosed in a in 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 past so that's called as element of novelty so you have to make sure huh, that whatever you are coming out and you want to file a patent it should not be there as an entire thing on one document so the obvious question is uh, is it possible then to get a patent if it if you know it is made up of three four parts and each part is mentioned in a different document so then comes the second element which is called as inventive step or non obviousness so then that means if i do some invention i file a patent the examiner will then first see if, uh, with respect to novelty whether anything you have disclosed and tried to claim is present in any prior art in a single document if he or she is unable to find then they will go to the next step so they will see if they if if there are three four documents and if a person skilled in the art an expert of that field if he reads if he is first he will, uh, the examiner will see if he is able to access those documents generally i mean he does he or she or a scientist or a researcher do, does not have to go out of the way to procure those documents so if he is a person skilled uh, skilled in the art for example a research chemist or a research physicist and they approach the library and they uh, come down with some references which uh, and and if he if he reads that document and the next document and the third and the fourth and the fifth and if he is able to arrive at your invention then it becomes non i mean your obvious uh, invention becomes obvious so you have to pass this second test also the third is that the patent will be granted so please mark the heading of the slide is patentability so patent will be granted only if if it has some industrial application but it is again the third most of the primary first two tools are novelty and non obviousness and the other is the patentable subject matter so certain things i like i mean uh, say anything to do with nuclear uh, weapon anything which will uh, harm the 
uh, you know the country something the, so something some certain things are clear cut no no any any country so you can, you will not be able to you know patent a bomb or something like that uh, you cannot patent anything which will destroy or which will be uh, you know can bring catastrophe or anything like that uh, to uh, the entire humanity so in many countries scientific theories aesthetic creations mathematical methods plant animal varieties and all natural substance methods are, these are subject to not being patentable so india also has a unique section certain sections are there which you know are upright in black and white uh it says that these are the things if you do these are not patentable per se they are not patentable and the last part is disclosure i mean how much amount of invention you have disclosed in your application that also will be under scrutiny when an examiner is uh, you know checking or examining your patent application so can we move to the next slide please so these are the type of patents i mean uh, so my core area has been us uh, so that's the reason why uh uh somebody is saying that my voice is not coming is it correct no sir your voice is clear okay okay so types of patents basically i mean so everybody follows us so i have taken up the us definitions basically so type of patents that will be granted are plant and design and utility patents so please note that they will be having having different patent life right a design patent will be have 7 to 10 years utility patent general all general patents on compounds on method of use on processes on manufacture on composition of matter these will uniformly be having a 20 years of life and uh, same is the case with uh, uh, plant so i will i will uh, you know qualify my statement with respect to plant in one of the subsequent slides can we move to the next slide please so with respect to plants and living organisms and you know what not i mean i think this will be something which will be of area of interest to the audience so anything which is so it's a very generic very uh, i would say you know a broad definition so anything if it is not able to meet it will not be a subject of qualifying for a patent of course you know there will be uh, finer nuances to it and then uh, jurisprudence have been established there are famous cases in us india everywhere where you know the fine fine finer lines have been read and interpreted by uh, both the prosecution and as well as the uh, the other party the the party which is defending the uh, invention so all those things have happened so basically a non natural just a minute please yeah basically a non natural occurring non human multicellular living organism including animals may all be eligible so anything which is natural no is not you are not it is not subject to uh, patenting number one so you know some audience you know somebody can question or say but i have seen some references where something is uh, has been patentable so examiner has found out that the outcome so you will have product by process claims so the process by which the product has been made that is not that is not natural process so that the, so the product which has been outcome of a non natural proce process which has been established in a laboratory an examiner has been able to you know uh, go through the entire thing and have reviewed it against prior art and have been finally and has finally concluded that yes this is something which is non natural and there is a experiment due experimentation has been done to arrive at the conclusion so it is eligible for patent so that's how it is being differentiated i mean uh, uh, a, a something which is just appearing in nature and something which is just not appearing in nature so claims directed to or encompassing a human organisms are of course ineligible and it has always been like that i mean okay let's move so in a pattern generally i mean even in india us europe australia canada everywhere so these will be the basic thing so the request will be the first page of a pattern which you know which will summarize all the inventions the date the priority the bibliographic information about the name and address of applicant and inventor so these are very important because it tells you that who are, who is the filer and basically there are two aspects of it one is the name of the inventors another is the assignee so there is a term called as assignee whenever uh, you do a due diligence and you uh, you know you are doing an invention and you write your invention and give it to your intellectual property department to find out whether it is a patent subject matter which is patentable or not so when uh, suppose the your your respective ip team maybe it's in house or out out outsource out uh, outside your company they they come up with a due diligence and find out that yes it is patentable so the first thing you have to establish or they have to write down is that who is filing the patent 
when is the date of filing where is the company based so there will be two things one is the name of the company that is termed as assignee and other are the individual inventors normally the practice is when a company files a patent the inventors are actually assigning their rights automatically to the company so company is the one who is going to be benefited by the outcome of that patent and you know certain many companies will have their internal adjustment and understanding and agreements that say for example a patent gets granted and is actually monetized then maybe some royalty also is given to the inventors who are the individual scientists but generally uh, uh, the practice uh, uh, is generally i mean a token amount is given to the inventors and the scientists and most of it is being i mean because the invention the material the experiments the, the you know the, all the all, all the feasibility the, in fact the, everything has, is provided by uh, the company itself so uh, they they do have the right to exploit the uh, the, the the benefit of the patent so uh, the first part uh, first page gives all those information then there is a detail the next you know bunch of 10 or 15 pages will give you the description of the entire uh, patent uh, and it will have in broad way it will encompass it will first start with introduction of the what is the prior art and then uh, it goes on to say which are the what is the science what are the experiments what are the you know then it narrows down to the examples and if there is a graph there is a table there is a diagram so all those things will also be provided in the patent and then the last but the but not the least i mean the most important part of the patent is the claims so this is as a, as the word says a clear and concise definition of the invention for a patent protection is being sought so drafting of a claims is an expertise and uh, you know experts will draft out the claim in such a way that it encompasses not only the your invention but also the surroundings of the invention can we go to the next slide please yeah so if anybody is interested i am not going to you know drill down to each aspect so generally what happens first when you file a patent so first is an patent application once it gets granted then only worldwide it is called as a patent so first when you submit an application a formal examination process starts in the patent office so patent examiner itself uh, within the uh, i mean within the patent office will do a search so and will establish a search report then there are established bodies which will conduct a search report and they can access those search reports so search report will be very specific to the field of your invention and the examiner is going to examine the patent in light of the results which has come out of the search so each and every search results maybe a, a journal maybe a patent application maybe a poster maybe some discovery or some somewhere you know some mention in a website if all these will surface out in a search result and the examiner will examine your invention and especially the claims against whatever is disclosed in those prior arts that has been yielded with from the search so the substantial examination happens and then the patentee the one who files the patent that is the assignee and the inventor they, they are called as the patentee so they the notification goes from examination uh, patent office to them that the, these are the res, results so there will be a preliminary report then they will, you will respond back to them then there will be a secondary report so this way you know a full time examination happens so there are many countries uh, I, I mean you will be astonished to know that many countries still today in year 2021 where the examination does not happen so their philosophy is they don't want to waste money and time so whatever you file it will get granted as such and it is the so uh, you understand right i mean you, you must have filed you must have written in the language of the claim any damn thing which is under the purview of the 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 description which you have mentioned in the body of the patent you get it claimed you you get it granted in that uh, uh, country of course you have to uh, you know uh, pay the filing fees and maintenance fees and of course now what happens in those kind of countries suppose the, you have filed on a x medicine say for example on a x drug or anything and suppose somebody wants to launch a product so it is the onus lies on that company you know to, to go to the patent office search out all the patents and whatever is related you know they will take a copy of it maybe your patent also gets uh, uh, you know it gets highlighted in his patent search and all that now the, that 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 third party i mean it's not the patent office of that country it's not you who has filed but the guy who is in, interested in uh, you know launching a product and if he feels that your patent is overlapping and there is some issue with your patent so he will file a revocation action in the patent office giving citing examples citing prior art and say that 
hey, you have got, got this thing granted, but this is not eligible. I mean, the patents, are, the claims are just hogwash. They are not really grantable patents. So it is the system in those, those kind of countries. I can give an example, like South Africa is something, whatever you file, whatever claims comes out from the WIPO PCT application, they are granted as such without examination. Then it is the onus lies on you, whosoever wants to you know, challenge and all, to you know, actually file a revocation action, go to the court, go to the patent office, and then uh, uh, you know, go get the claims amended. So normally what happens if, if, the, if the, the party who has filed the patent, if he's not responding, you can very safely assume that it is, a, you know, it's, it's just, a, just something that he has filed. So, well, you know, how you do it? So India has a very good system of examination. In India, the rule is any Indian company or anybody who is out, who's, who is a naturalized citizen of India, the rule of Indian patent office is you can go to US, you can go to Europe, Australia, Canada, any damn country. First and foremost, your invention or our patent application has to be filed in India. And then you will have to wait for one year and then only you can take forward your exam, uh, application to other countries. So that's the natural, uh, you know, the, the rule of patent office in India. So you have to take priority out of India and then only with that number you can file and go ahead uh, for other countries. Of course, there are ways where you can bypass Indian patent filing also. So I don't think so. We, we can, it's necessary to you know discuss all those in this forum. So then you see there's a the once the patent is issued, uh, sorry, the, the the application is substantively examined. I'm using the word application. Then it gets published. After the publication, so first you will see a patent application with an XYZ number as a patent application number. And then once it has been able to you know withstand the examination and all, then only the notice of grant happens in a journal. Uh, the notice of grant is given. So you know people or companies of who are, who have interest can you know see and if they want to oppose they can oppose they can you know there are every country has different different procedures and if if it has not happened then it gets granted i mean nobody has opposed then it gets granted once it gets granted now your name of the document is called as patent now you can say yes i have pat four patents five patents a granted document only is called as patent so then you have to pay fees and also there is a grace period given to you that uh, then there is grace period if you can if you want to extend that patent to different countries and all and then you know different countries will have different rules like a patent once is once it is granted after the period of grant it has opposition period like uh, you know anybody can challenge your patent because finally you know it is a granted patent which is which is actually of content i mean you know, it is that, that's an issue if somebody is uh, sort of overlapping and trying to uh, infringe upon your claim so that's where this, that's the reason why our opposition period is given. India is a typical country. US also has this facility. Even Europe has a facility. You can also oppose in pre-grant stage. So they have this facility. India also has a pre-grant facility. Let's move to the next slide, please. So let's move to the next slide. Now, yeah, move to the next slide. Yes. So uh, I actually wanted to introduce maybe because of the, uh, uh, the heading and uh, the subject which Dr. Vyas shared with me. So one is the, you know, the chemistry aspect, another is the biology aspect. So in US, there is a, there is a office of CDER and in uh, case of biology, there is a CBER. So Center of Biologics uh, Evaluation Research. Uh, so, and another is the drug. Uh, D stands for drug and B stands for biology. So uh, two different bodies. Initially, when the, so see that the, the biologic units was started later, so initial all biologics were approved under CDR, which drugs evaluation uh, research body only in US. So there's an overlap. So you will see biologics in US uh, authorized by the drug research organization as well as by biologics research organization. But you know, slowly and slowly the biologics things is getting refined and it is getting established. And uh, so eventually in future, you will, you will see that all will be uh, approved in US only under the CBER uh body and uh generally uh, uh you know the, so when there is a patent you have a right when there is a patent it means there is an innovator so there is a industry of generics also who want to bring medicine to various part of the various countries uh, uh, uh you know which will be a cheaper and a sort of a uh affordable version of our drug so uh in case of biologic the first launch or the first product which is uh, approved and launched, I would use the word approved and launched, 
is a is called as a reference product huh? that's a general terminology which is used uh, anything uh, so since it's a biologic right i mean it's not a chemistry where the structure is very defined and uh, it's very easy you know in maybe uh, at the most uh, 20 50 steps you are able to synthesize and the the the, the structure is well characterized it's, it's not a bigger molecule so it, it doesn't have a 3d structure in that sense like uh, a protein has a primary secondary tertiary and what not i mean number of ways it folds and is present in nature and when they are getting synthesized in the laboratory by innovator so here in case of biologics we have to be careful so that's why the term uh, 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 you know the product which is being brought in market subsequently is called not as a uh, uh, as a uh, uh, something which is equivalent of reference it is called as a similar so it is not it is not same the word is used not bio same so it is called it can be called as a bio better or something like that but it is always termed as a bio similar so at the most you can be similar you cannot be same so another classification or uh, you know definition which is term which is used is interchangeable now very uh, quickly i will just uh, you know explain what it is in case of uh, once a product is approved and launched in us so you know doctors are prescribing so they will prescribe a reference product because that's the first product so it can be a map or it can be something else so it's a it's called as a reference product now if the patent expires and all so biosimilar you know companies which are good in generic business they will come up with this bio product which is same to as uh, reference so it cannot be same so it has to be biosimilar so it has to come you know uh, navigate its way through regulatory as well as through patent maze of uh, innovator so uh, it's called as a biosimilar so in case of a biosimilar when it is launched in market it cannot be switched at the end of pharmacy without the prescription of a doctor qualified doctor now please here i mean please mark my words what i'm saying when a biosimilar is a product which cannot be automatically switched by a pharmacist in us the medicines are sold by pharmacists and it is with, I, mean, I mean you have otc as well as a prescribed uh, section so rx is a prescribed section so it is the doctor who has to write first that okay you, you know you you need not buy the innovator you can buy a generic and then that prescription the patient or somebody from the patient side will go to the pharmacist the pharmacy will see the prescription and then only will give the cheaper option which is a biosimilar whereas in case of interchangeable product you need not go to a doctor for switching if a product has been it's it's a biosimilar product but it's 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 a, a level or two higher than a biosimilar product it has been construed and it has been approved by the fda regulatory agency as something which is interchangeable at the hands of pharmacists so if you go to the pharmacy and the pharmacy and ask for the drug the pharmacy will ask i mean without showing any prescription the pharmacist will say yes there is an interchangeable product and it is ten dollars less so would you like to have it so you can say yes and so neither the pharmacist nor the doctor nor the patient none of them are liable you know in terms of uh, if any any health issues or any quality issues or anything happens because it has been deemed to be that product has been deemed to be an interchangeable product whereas in case of biosimilar that is not the case on the left hand of the slides i'm sure i mean the audience is uh, aware of that. these are the products which are classified in us as uh, biologics and then there are many more to this can we move to the next slide please so a very interesting concept uh, in us is that in case of small molecules no there is a there is a website by fda called as orange book uh, it's called as orange book it does not look like i mean the website is no, no it's not orange in color so orange book will have list of all approved products which are small molecules and which and uh, uh, which will also have i mean if there are any patents which are of concern listed or any regulatory exclusivity if it is of if it has been given by fda they all will be present in that whereas in case of biologics you, the the equivalent of biologics is called as purple book so per, so i am though i am using the term book actually it is the name of the website yeah the book is also there but for general worldwide audience or for us uh, you can refer to the website and it will have all the necessary information so in case of purple book in case of biologics unfortunately only the approved you know the biosimilars or the innovators which is the rld re reference listed drug uh, and if there is any interchangeable product 
only these information will be there the name of the product the company which has brought it the approval date whatever this so it will not show any kind of say exclusivity or any uh, kind of uh, patents listed against that but you know a generic product cannot be brought to the uh, market if innovator has patents so we don't know which are the patents how many are the patents which are of concern so uh, say uh, any uh, ip savvy company a pharmaceutical company or a company like biocon or say panacea biotech they will have their internal ip department so the ip department will do its own due diligence they will find out and from the search report they will say that these 25 patents are of concern so the, we should make sure that our product whichever we are bringing to the us market they should not be infringing when i am saying the word infringing you are not trespassing the claims which are granted in those respective patents now in case of orange book i am 100% sure because i i i don't have to do all that uh, you know hard work it's i will definitely do the hard work because there are non listed patents also but those patents are already there in the website i can see and i can certify against those patents and just go ahead and file that dossier whereas in case of biologics there is a process called as patent dance because i till to till date i don't know which are the patents he is going to enforce you know and bring a lawsuit against me so just for the the yeah, sake of uh, you know understanding just go through the abbreviation so uh, abla is a abbreviated biologics license application which is filed by a generic company and rps is a reference product sponsor so he is the innovator and a biosimilar applicant uh, so, so somebody who is uh, filing this company uh, a generic company say he is called as a ba so can we move to the next slide please uh okay so can we move to the next slide so the previous slide i mean when the audience has time you can go through but in nutshell i have explained the entire uh, way that this this thing happens in this slides so actually this is also courtesy of a reference i have picked up and i have given due acknowledgement to the reference from where i have picked up this simple uh, you know uh, time frame kind of thing so first the fda will so already there is, so in order to understand this slide already there is a reference product is there by a sponsor so already there is a innovator product sell, being sold in the market so after this what happens a generic company indian company it files a abla now what happens there is a there is a catch to it whenever a innovator files an application and innovator gets its approval from there a 12 year block starts so i cannot launch any product 12 years from the day uh, innovator has got its approval and has launched its product in us another thing is i cannot as a generic company i cannot file 4 years before this uh, uh, innovator approval so uh, uh, i hope you have understood so till 12 years F uh, fda or this uh, regulatory agency in us will not give me approval from the date the their the clock starts the day innovator gets approval and also i will not be able to file as a generic company i will not be i will have to so suppose today uh, innovator company gets an approval and launches its product i will have to wait at least 4 years to file my application in fda so that's the concept so my day zero starts after 4 years so 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 just for the sake of understanding if say on day zero an application comes in us by a uh, uh ba which is a uh, a generic company so on day 20 so from zero from first day to 20th day uh, all such informations my process my specifications my uh, you know my sops my uh, every damn thing my entire document details has to be handed over to the rps which is innovator so as soon as i have filed within 20 days i have to disclose every damn thing to the innovator so i have not only filed my application to fda which is the regulatory agency i have also to disclose all my details as a generic company to the innovator company now what happens next the innovator after seeing my details will list out a list of patents and will come back and tell me that uh these are the things and uh, your your product or your application is actually infringing it is trespassing these patents so i get a list from innovator so after i get the list from innovator i don't have any other i mean there is no way i, I mean either i can withdraw my application or i have to fight it out so what i do 
i provide my grounds or my belief or what i feel that which are valid claims which are enforceable claims against each of those suppose he has given me a list of 100 patents and each patent say for example has 10 claims so i have to give an explanation and understanding and the position with respect to my product against all the thousand claims so on day 200 on day 200 the, uh, the by this time the you know the the, the invent, inventor i mean sorry the innovator company will have all details it will also have all details and arguments which i have written and provided him against all the thousand claims or uh, with respect to those uh, 10 patents uh, or 100 patents whatever so after day 200 the sponsor here rp is again i mean retirity it is the innovator they will submit claim by claim on each patent what they feel about it so after day 215 uh you know so either you negotiate with them in good faith which means say for example here at the very beginning he will give a master list of say 100 patents after seeing details after seeing your grounds after seeing your response then he will feel yeah come on this is 100 is not the real number maybe 10 is the real number of patents which actually the innovator feels that so basically because in biology because in this area of biologics the the complication with respect to patent patent claims and the information which is disclosed in the patent body is such a huge amount of information such complicated that regulatory agents has given this provision that you two guys fight it out before coming back to me so you two guys which is the innovator and the generic company please narrow down your issues and then come back to me so in general it gives around 200 to 215 days for both the parties to establish their what are the real contentious issues so once that is fixed then the sponsor that is the innovator company will file a patent i mean infringement action that is then it will bring a lawsuit against you against uh, a generic company so then you have to fight it out in court after you fight it out in court and if you win or if you get a kind of a settlement and by that time your approval comes then only you will be able to launch a, bi a biologic product a biosimilar product or if it's an interchangeable product in us market so you can understand whereas in small small molecules in chemistry molecules generally uh, i think the first right you have i mean that's how you know the first kind of a situation where it is possible to launch a product it can be as quick as or it can be as early as maybe two and a half years whereas you can imagine here i mean 12 years is minimum after that also it can stretch so this is a general way of which you know generic industry can fight and bring generic products in us now such kind of patent dance is not there in india here in india you just have to fight out i mean because you don't have this mechanism of orange book or uh, you know um, uh, purple book or any book here you have to do your own due diligence and as soon as you file your dossier to dcgi the cgi will notify the innovator and innovator will sue you and then so here suit happens first and then you sort out the issues whereas in us they have given this is just to save time and you know cost and all because us is very expensive so they have formatted a way of doing this can we go to the next slide so purple book i think i have explained and the definition be between biosimilar and interchangeable that part that thing also i have uh, you know sort of explained can we go to the next slide please yeah so i have explained the interchangeable definition also which means you you know it can be switched at the end of the at the hands of a pharmacist so a pharmacist is equivalent to a chemist shop here i mean he, the, the situation is different uh, there uh, here you know yeah, they yeah, so us there is a different system so there is a pill tray then there is a bottle so there the most of the medicines are sold in bottles so actually the doctors will prescribe out the number of tablets and whatever and then there will be certain drugs which have to be reconstituted so it's the job of the pharmacists they are qualified they have they are professionals they have degree and they only are the right persons to handle the drug so they only will give you tailor-made medication whatever doctor has prescribed so interchangeable is something that they can do it at their end and they do not consult back or, or refer back to a prescription can we go to the next slide please yeah so what is going to happen uh if uh, innovator conducts some additional studies in pediatric subjects so that 12 years or any patents listed against this will get an extension of further six months so that's basically the gist of it 
and if there is a orphan indication you know that in case of orphan indication it is 7 years in us and in europe it is 10 years so those gets attached to the exclusive period a bla reference which is a biologic license application generally has a 12 year exclusivity whereas a small chemical has a 5 years so these all will go and exclusivities will run in parallel can we go to the next slide please uh this is so this is actually basically to say that when suppose an innovator today has got an approval it's a new product so novart is is coming with a new product so today it has got an approval and all that so within 30 days it has to tell fda that which are the uh, you know uh, which are the patterns which are the things which are, which uh, which are the exclusivities which it is seeking for all these things within 30 days they has to Uh, uh you know uh, give give this information to the fda so that's basically it has to give what are the patents list and all that so it's just basically a uh, 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 you know a regulatory minute cell by law they have to give whatever information they have to give they have to give to fda within 30 days yeah so these are the things so biology so there is this uh, you know this legislation or this special section which is biological product patent transparency bppt in us so basically you have to note down uh, so i have been saying that purple book till date does not give much information like listing of patents and all that so all this you know the new section has come so fda is actually right now you know as i am speaking it is working on this they have been given a 180 days notice i mean 6 months notice from last year so the after enactment so june uh 25 2021 is the date by which uh you know all these things are expected from fda so what they will do for each product like small chemicals they will give the ex exclusivity period will be also there in the website then it will also classify whether it is a biosimilar that it classifies whether it is interchangeable or not it will also publish the patent list so this patent dance and all which ever i explained you know there will be more granularity and clarity so i will be able to see in website which are the patents of concern i have to take care of before filing my marketing application to fda for a generic equivalent for a innovator next next slide please yeah so this is i i, I just want to you know acknowledge uh, the references uh, most of this reading material you will get it here and uh, i really am thankful for university and especially dr vyas for giving me this opportunity to speak in this forum thank you very much audience for patiently hearing me out thank you so much sir it's a very uh, nice and elaborative and informative uh, presentation on the basics of ip and how we can uh, file the patent and what are the process and especially timeline and uh, regarding the authorities and uh, What kind of rights we have? Uh, we have one or two questions here. Like one question is: the patent is expensive. India generic companies work on incremental innovation like NDDS. Enforcement enforcement is difficult. What should be the key criteria for patent filing international market? Okay, so I think the question is very pertinent and relevant. I mean, you know, since uh, I, since inception of IP in India, I would say this this has been bothering all of us. enforcement first aspect i'm talking so enforcement is very poor in india like even if i have a patent in india i can just do surreptitiously anything and just and still you will see you know products are being sold in market which are innovator has patent but there is a sea change in since last 5 years what i have seen now if there is a patent you know especially all the top companies of india all generic companies of india we are very savvy we will not bring any product to the patent uh, to the market if it is patented in india so that is one of the basic things which i have seen uh, I, and i am i'm seriously uh, uh, i mean i was concerned initially but uh, you know the wave the change has started happening and all prestigious good companies do honor patents so whatever if uh, you know still if somebody can find a copycat uh, product for example uh, there are i will tell you you know what what the issues are so one is the uh, fake drug so fake drugs is something it is actually not drug you know somebody is making some powder and then uh, you know compressing it into a tablet or filling it in capsules and selling labeling it so they are doing say, you know these are criminal offenses they are doing but in terms of patent what happens so india has a patent regime right we, we every uh, uh, you know multinational company can come and file 
and india is a you know signatory so it has to honor patent and all that so what happens in india is especially you can see you know right now the the uh, this uh, uh, the covid situation is happening and you know, many many drugs are you know just out of shelf or market and all that so do indian companies are trying its best so if you approach you know these chemists and all that they will say aapko bangladeshi uh, drug mil jayega so what happens actually bangladesh bangladesh is a country where the patent regime is still not full fledged so they still you, there are no, product patent are still not granted so what is happening those patent, those drugs are being made there it is like, legally they are being made there but you know unofficially and through smuggling channel they are being uh, uh, you know imported and uh, you know indian so there is a nexus i would say i mean so this is a mishandling misuse of a patent but indian agencies indian government indian establishment indian companies all are ip savvy they fully honor ip and i think uh, they are trying to enforce and uh, i see a sea change now we we are struggling you know if i want to buy a reference product i have to go and seek permission from innovator second thing what innovator companies are also doing you know indian companies are also innovator they have come up with their own drugs now uh, so they are also enforcing patent so they uh, so you have a right to information that rti act you can approach dcgi or state regulatory agency and can see which all companies have filed application for a patented drug you will be able to you know get hold and you will you will see you know many companies are getting notices and there are many legal cases which are happening so yes so i think india is slow but uh, very fast uh, uh, they will they will they will uh, you know uh, honor uh, the entire ip of uh, uh, all aspects i would say not only patents but designs trademarks and every damn thing so i'm sorry i forgot what was the first question the first aspect of the question uh, it was what should the key criteria for patent filing in international market okay so uh, another thing uh, which i mean the related to this was the expense so i don't think so as i said as i qualified it may be expensive for individual inventors to file invent individual authors to file otherwise filing a patent in indian patent office is not a big deal globally it may be a uh, uh, issue but then wipo has created a forum which is wipo so you can file a pct application and designate x number of countries so in initial stage you can still keep you know your application submerged you know you need not so the expense starts when you start prosecuting your patent and then when you are maintaining a patent so then then only the expenses start otherwise filing a patent application is not a not a not an expensive affair and the criteria as i mentioned i mean one is that you make sure that it is not novelty destroying art which you are trying to claim you your product i mean the most dangerous part is the non obviousness so novelty destroying is fine so you will you i I'm, i'm sure we are not foolish any company any university is not foolish to go ahead and file a application which is already there in the uh, public domain or is already there disclosed in the literature whole as such it is only the non obvious part uh, uh, you know that threshold is very difficult to cross so india you must have heard about section 3d so that is actually nothing but this uh, non obvious thing say for example a molecule is patentable a salt of a molecule is not patentable so a salt of a molecule is patentable provided you have done clinical trials and it's therapeutically effective efficacy and it has shown efficacy i mean all those things so the the threshold the the, the barriers are higher so that's that's what i would like to say as an answer to this query right so that means if we'll go through the wipos and that is our uh, patent application maybe in that case it can be go for uh, multiple countries Instead of going to country by country, so we can go on uh, in a one application with many countries to WIPO PCT application. Yeah, so I I I have to make this thing clear. So WIPO is an application. WIPO is never a patent. Right. So which which means WIPO can never grant a patent. Right. So WIPO is a tool to hold your application for one year, two years, three years, something like that. Actually, thirty one months. Mm-hmm. So after that, you have to decide. You know, it cannot be unending. so then you have to decide which countries you have to go for example in europe you need not go nowadays individually to europe filing a patent application is very expensive so you find a ep patent and in the ep patent in the front page you can designate your countries and accordingly file your fees accordingly the patent will get examined and it's a uni- uniform patent one patent one document one examination so one expense but it is having value i mean in terms of it is giving you exclusive rights 
in say a set of 30 countries or 40 countries whatever i mean a number of countries you designate any ep patent if you open that's why i said the first page is very important at the bottom of the first page you will see the two letter country code european country code similarly in case of wipo the first page will give you two letter country code of all the wipo countries and see the general trend is for example see i am i'm coming from a generic pharma industry so we will file an application you know i know uh, so you know patent application patent procedures patent laws has given you the provision to keep it hanging as an application because all patent applications will not mature into a patent because you don't need them suppose i do some invention and two years down the line say for example uh you know there is a discussion which is going on i'm just giving you a hypothetical example for covid say for example a drug called favipiravir is really working magic and all that right i mean just give me hypothetical don't don't take it literally now suddenly we see that the entire uh, attention focus and uh, you know the way we are addressing doc, doc i mean all big companies have gone ahead and trying to do the research it is shifted from small molecule to a vaccine so tomorrow i may feel you know my patent on favipiravir is useless i mean the application which i have done so i may take a business decision because maintaining of a, a patent is a is a uh, expensive affair so generally it will be done by organizations like csir or a university or a company very very rarely by a inventor you know a individual inventor i have hardly seen in india maybe one maybe you will see but in us you will definitely i mean even inventors are exp- are rich so if he is a venture capitalist he will get some fund and he will keep on maintaining his patent so in in your uh, talk you're talking about this pct filing yes so can you just a uh, little bit elaborate uh, what is PC- pct filing and what are the advantages of pct filing so i think the answer i have already explained so pct is a forum it's a wipo forum so pct is a uh treaty actually the cooperation which provides this uh, wipo forum so okay. very simple to understand what you do i mean i'm uh, addressing this to the entire audience mm-hmm. so you just go to the website and type wipo w i p o patent search okay. i mean uh, so when you go there you click on any patent so this wipo body in mm-hmm. in terms of i think the wipo application uh, pct filing fees are is fees is around 4000 euros so with 4000 euros only you will be able to maintain an application for 31 months okay. so first you got filed in india you waited for one year and then you can decide to either go out or you can still wait or you can file a pct application and then come back and file a patent application so so pct all these bodies also gives you an advantage of time frame say for example i have filed an application in india and see uh, any invention any 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 research is not something that i start today and i will end tomorrow right so i do something then somebody joins my research team he takes forward that or i do this in this x lab so some collaboration happens with the university they take forward that application you know so wipo application will always keep an option open that your invention can keep on moving so which means you can still take the priority of your previous application still code the first application still code and you know uh, write like something that all the previous applications which is filed under this has uh, are encompassed within this invention so you take reference you take re- uh, uh, sort of uh, protection of the previous application and still continue to maintain your ap- application and at the end of the day take a business decision that exactly now i go want to go ahead and file so pct also does at a very nominal charge within that fees of 4000 euros i believe i mean that is what i mean when last time i had filed uh, that was the fees so they will do uh, patent searching also so uh, the patent search made by a wipo is honored by us patent examiner is honored by europe patent examiner it's honored by indian patent office also so you get many benefits i would say if you file a pct application right so one document one single document it allows you to file at a later stage many many countries if i don't do that then i i, I can i will be still be in india so then i have to you know check and say for example a country like tanzania or kenya for example it is a arv drug so i have to go and find out what are the patent filing conditions so for example in india i can stay alive only for a period of one year so for example today i have done some invention and i file a year uh, this patent application a year down the line so if i do that so 
if i cross one year plus one day entire thing becomes i mean is damaged it is becomes a prior art it is known in prior art i will not be eligible to file a patent application there but if i keep on filing and if i have done a pct application my invention still keeps alive because that procedure itself give me is the benefit of extending beyond one year to go for a patenting if i can keep in uh, for a moment sure. um, i think uh, wipo is a uh, single window clearance uh, system for multiple uh, applications actually so wipo as an organization it actually caters to the procedural aspects of intellectual property certainly substantive aspects are actually uh, we all know that uh, the all most of you know all the intellectual property rights are territorial in nature so substantive aspects are actually ba uh, based on the territorial uh, laws and policy but procedural aspects are actually streamlined through the world intellectual property organizations forum which is actually which administers around 24 uh, uh, you know uh, procedural treaties in, in regard to intellectual property matters yeah mr amit you are absolutely right uh, so i just like to add one more thing here so uh, so yp wipo will keep my document alive and hanging in international forum but once i decide that i have to now enter into say kenya or nairobi for a arv drug so then i have to you know go into the patent office and exactly. you know get it prosecuted so i mean very easy for students to understand is if you see any any say for example any europe application or a south africa application and if you go to the file wrapper the file history you will see the priority document will be either if the company originated from india the indian application will be there in that website or if it is a pct application that wipo application which mr amit is referring it will be hanging there so from there the, the, uh, the that becomes the bible i mean that becomes the the, the key point i mean that from there you can extrapolate to the various countries and of course it is territorial so patent definitely will be granted by the respective country and it will be further prosecuted only by the respective country ip department right. okay. i mean the patent office department sorry okay. yeah dr dev uh... regarding trademark so when we are talking about generic terms and uh, marks on the generic terms like uh, we have burger king and like burger king so can we take a trademark on the generic terms or uh, it's restricted somewhere we cannot use or first who has who's ever used so i knew it was coming this burger singh and burger king uh, thing so uh, yeah so if you if you if you ask me as a professional Yeah. so it is very unfortunate that uh, this fellow is carrying on his business so it is not only he started from i believe somewhere delhi or bangalore and now i see these chain of restaurants every damn place in india right. and they are also boasting that they will uh, go out and all so what happens so i have seen it myself actually so i will tell you another example not related to this but in a pharma industry so uh, as a company when i i was working in a company uh, i mean one of my first companies ran backsy so we had licensed out arv patents for south africa country from gilead so gilead is innovator of remdesivir you know that so gilead and we had been selling and as per the agreement we have been giving them royalty so it went on and on and all that and the patent was there still 5 years of patent life was there so i will not name in public forum very st and prestigious company uh, top most companies in india suddenly they launched their product in south africa and they also had agreement with gilead and they just uh, you know they uh, terminated the agreement in uh, with gilead and said that we will go on our own you do whatever you do like we will not pay you royalty so now you can imagine the situation my company paying royalty mm -hmm. in good faith these company were also paying royalty but they continued in the market terminating and saying you we will see what you can do we approached gilead and said boss what is this happening uh, it is uh, in good faith that we want to continue we want to maintain relationship we want to still uh, we want to honor your agreement we will continue to pay royalty but can you enforce your patent in south africa and stop these guys so you know what they said so uh, you know at at cer certain point of time uh, these uh, especially what i have seen i mean this is their mentality this is the psyche of innovator companies 
certain companies are very aggressive like for example johnson and johnson janson then for example bms they are very example they are aggressive they will not spare any small or big or any damn company if you infringe on their intellectual property or trademarks or any any of their rights which have been given by india indian patent office but there are certain companies there are certain multinationals which at the end of the day say that access is the biggest thing we want the affordable medicine to uh, you know come in place uh, we would do we are now no longer interested to fight you so in burger king in burger king episode i believe the same thing has happened i mean they are frustrated uh, i think they filed but i didn't uh, uh, they were not able to injunct so you know you can continue to do the pop you know the sin <laughs> unless you are injuncted so if i am injuncted and in india does not have clear cut provisions of penalty right if you do the same thing in us uh, mm-hmm. they will make sure that you pass through your nose and you are entire you know uh, you will be sort of a, turned into a helpless situation so this is unfortunate in a country like uh, india thank you sir thank you so much so we have to develop that much. kind of culture actually and uh, i think uh, generation of intellectual property and also protection and recognition and awareness about ip and i think uh, through these seminars that we offer i think so clear said then done <laughs> yeah absolutely right i agree yeah thank you so much now i request uh, our dean uh, dr vyas uh, singhadgiri ji uh, to uh, say a few words as a concluding remark of this uh, session okay please sir thank you so i think santru first of all thanks a lot no thank you very much thank you so much for sparing time i know he's very busy no, no. and i have been you. knowing him since long time now <laughs> so <laughs> he has moved across the industry and he has done a degree in uh, law so we can understand his depth of knowledge and he has worked on bench in the for the patents so many of the people have just talking about the patents but he has worked so that's a lot of difference between the two and that's why he was able to explain very clearly every processes and what are the issues associated with certain litigations and to come out of that i think the ip department is held with their neck there is always a sword on their neck so it's a difficult job and they have been doing it and he explained it very nicely i think our students were very fortunate enough to listen to shantanu i thank you very much santu and in a very short time he agreed to my request and uh, helped us by giving a wonderful lucid as well as elucidated lecture thank you thank you doctor. so much santu then i think we had a series of lecture today i think there was a person called as shashank manohar who talked mainly mainly on the ipr issues in the agricultural driven development he spoke in general he talked about the history of the ipr in general and specific to india and he also told about what the scientists to be need to know how they should be aware to protect their science their innovations many of the scientists work but they don't understand what they do and how they should protect it so he talked uh, very vividly on and since he worked mainly on the agriculture part he spoke a lot on those aspect and there were many issues he could have talked more to us if the time would have permitted to him but it was very good talk and there were questions he could answer very nicely dr jyoti kaul i think was fantastic and since i have taken her immediately after that because she also spoke on mainly on the agricultural ipr and with special references to ppv as well as fr acts and since her area of specialization was maize and she told very clearly maize is being the very old and global crop in india and she spoke about different varieties of maize and how we have been really progressing and we are able to really compete with us in all those products that they have been developing we could easily do that so her talk was very good and it was excellent talk and basically our students who are doing something on plant biotechnology will be more i think appreciate that so thank you madam thank you jyoti madam and she has been for throughout from morning to up till now and we really thank you ma'am for sparing such a lot of time i know you are also very busy scientist in ipr we had visited you 
our team of students as well as our faculty has visited you thanks a lot and i think we don't have here archana jatkar who spoke very well on i think she spoke on the global development in ipr and with relation to basically covid and i think it was she gave a fantastic idea being in ipa she gave us the how the pharmaceutical companies have really worked and helped in this pandemic by continuously working despite the entire country was in lockdown so they were able to really give manufacture and supply the drugs which were required during the emergency there were challenges and they are trying to meet those challenges with the help of the regulators as well as talking to the different pharmaceutical companies especially for remdesivir and probably for tocilizumab so it was a wonderful talk i think we were really blessed on this ipr international day i thanks uh, thank you doctor uh, thank our vice chancellor dr dankar who gave a inaugural talk today and really ignited the flame and then our amit singh who is the dean of law school i think because of him we could actually arrange this i really thank and extend all the uh, support given by our faculty like dr atul and my entire faculty like dr kar dr priya and especially dr saroj so i thank every faculty for giving me the support to organize this and i think i would thank uh, dr amit again once again thank you so much thank thanks you, a lot my pleasure sir yeah thank it you it was really pleasure thank you so much thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you thank you all thank you thanks a lot thank with this are we closing right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. all right thank you thank you students for uh, be here and uh, for the entire session thank you so much thank you should we leave now i'm closing